Speaker, the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, February 14th, 2023. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Roa Hassan. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73 and Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the February 14th agenda. Dr. Yarbrough, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Madam Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board, based upon recent conversations, I would like to request that the virtual learning program for school year 2023, school year 2024, be added to tonight's agenda. Board members, may I have a motion to add new business virtual learning programs to tonight's agenda? Place this as item K after unfinished business, work session on the FY 2024 budget, and re-letter any agenda items that come after. So moved, Pumphrey. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Hen. Thank you. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Favor is nine. The motion passes. The revised agenda is approved and the is approved. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice, and conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The summary of the closed session and open session information summary can be found on board docs under this meeting, under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lichter. Vice Chair Harvey, Deputy Superintendent Yarbrough, and members of the board. I like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves, deceased recognition of service, and certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D5? So moved, Harvey. Thank you, do I have a second? Second, Pumphrey. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. The motion passes. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Thank you. 
The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Yarbrough. Madam Chair Witzer, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board, I am bringing forward the following. Take two. Take two. Madam Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board, I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. One, Supervisor, Behavior, Department of Special Education, and two, Senior Supervisor, Design, Office of Facilities Construction and Improvement. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved, Hassan. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Savoy. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mrs. Hassan? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Dr. Yarbrough? Thank you. First appointment this evening. It's Ms. Pamela Strickland. Pamela is here with us. Can you please stand? Pamela Strickland is being promoted from Senior Project Engineer, Office of Facilities Construction and Improvement to Senior Supervisor at Design, Office of Facilities Construction and Improvement. Her background includes Senior Project Engineer with the Office of Facilities Construction, Whitman, Required, and Associates for seven years, Patton, Harris, and Rust, and Eastern State Engineering. She has six Point seven years of service in Baltimore County. Congratulations, Ms. Strickland. And our final appointment from this evening, watching virtually, is Kelly Evans. She is being promoted to Supervisor of Behavior in the Department of Special Education. Her previous experience includes Specialist, Behavior Analyst, Department of Special Education, Families Connect, LLC, Arrow Center for Education, Forbush School at Glendon, which is a part of the Shepherd Pratt Health System, and Kennedy Krieger. She has six years of experience in Baltimore County. Congratulations, Ms. Evans. Congratulations again, and thank you, Dr. Yarbrough. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we'll refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. Online registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. No speaker substitutions will be allowed. For those who were not selected through the online registration, a wait list sign-up sheet was available 30 minutes prior to the meeting. If a registered speaker is absent, speaker slots will be reassigned from the wait list so that the 10 speaker sp slots are allocated. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Persons using language that is threatening or promotes violence against a BCPS employee are subject to legal penalties. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. I ask speakers to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcbs.org. 
more information is provided on the board website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. I will now call on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. Our first speaker is Billy Burke, representing CASE. Mrs. Lichter, can you hear me? I can hear you, Mr. Burke. Thank you. Good evening, Chairwoman Mrs. Lichter, <laughs> Vice Chairwoman Mrs. Harvey, Deputy Superintendent Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of CASE. Dr. Williams, CASE would like to thank you for your service to Baltimore County and we wish you nothing but success as you finish your work here and plan your next chapter. I have two items I would like to discuss this e evening. The first item is a call for stability as we prepare for change. I understand there may be a need to transfer administrators, but please consider leaving people where they are unless they've made requests or there is an urgent need. And as we begin to hire assistant principals and principals and central office leaders, Please consider BCPS employees first. It will be important to maintain historical knowledge as we move forward. The second item has to do with principal and administrator safety and protection. Case members understand that when they take on leadership positions, they are subject to public criticism. But as their union representation, I am not seeing public criticism. What I see is people using social media to speculate, spread false information, and even lie about school administrators. PACE believes that parents and the community should be strong advocates for students and hold administrators accountable. But they too should be held accountable when they make false and slanderous accusations. There is a way to communicate truth without exposing students or violating their rights. BCPS leadership and the board must speak out against this abuse. This week, I had to support an administrative team whose lives have been threatened by a parent. Not one threat, but multiple threats. There have been no trespass letters issued and peace orders acquired by the administrators from the courthouse. The peace order should have been acquired by the system. Having the administrator acquire the order actually puts the system at risk. The parent response to the no trespass letter was, you have to leave the building at some point, I'll just get you then. More needs to be done. We can't wait until something horrible happens. We can have courage and act and still maintain people's rights. We can have courage and act and still maintain a relationship with parents and the community. We need your help. We need you to protect. We need you to lead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Our next speaker is Marietta English, representing the NAACP of Baltimore County. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Chair Leitner, Vice Chair Harvey. I'm sorry, Superintendent Williams isn't here, but other members of the board. I am Marietta English, Chair of the NAACP Baltimore County Branch Education Committee and Chair of AXO. Happy Valentine's Day. I hope you will have time to enjoy the rest of the evening. I just want to share with you that AXO is up and running. We have had meetings with our students and we've had meetings with our committee and we are ready for our competition that will be held on April the 29th at Newtown High School. We're continuing to recruit students. We have encouraged our students to participate in celebrations of African American History Month. Some are participating in poster contests, writing contests and oratory contests and we are certainly expecting to have winners. Thank you for your partnership and support of this program. Being new to the position of education chair of the NAACP Baltimore County Branch, I look forward to working with the board as we search for a new superintendent and on committees. 
Thank you to Dr. Williams for all your support and all you have done for Baltimore County students and staff. I would like to con connect with a member of the board and staff to, to discuss how we can work together for the benefit of our children. I look forward to working with Doug Handy and the Equity Committee, and I also look forward to working with the system as a partner with many events the with the district, such as parent engagement, the job fair, and other events that we can be a partner with. I'm excited about working with the district, and I look forward to, the very, to a very productive year. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marla Posey Moss, representing the PTA Council. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to visit with you today. I'm Marla Posey Moss, the president of Free State PTA, the official state PTA Congress representing national PTA in the state of Maryland. Thank you, President Lecter and Board of Education members for having me here today. First, I would like to share with you what distinguishes PTA from other parent groups, especially since all PTAs are nonprofits and are membership-based advocacy associations. As the largest child advocacy association in Maryland with over 50,000 members, the Free State PTA values collaboration, commitment, diversity, respect, and accountability. The state PTA works with constituent PTAs on a myriad of professional business expectations ranging from leadership training, adherence to financial guidelines and documents such as bylaws, promotion of partnerships within the school community, and administration of programs and grant funding that promote family engagement, the arts, health and safety, literacy, and a host of other parent interests that contributes to a positive school climate. A critical component that underlies our work as a PTA family is diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI. The PTA realizes that strong education that considers DEI helps children, their families, and school communities be successful Moreover, a quality education is, atta is attained when diverse voices, perspectives, and experiences are infused in acquiring knowledge and learning in the classroom, executing policies and proce procedures, and professional development. Additionally, achievement is approved when the implementation of education is tailored with the proper resources to meet the needs of students. That is equity. Membership to PTA is always open to anyone who believes in the purposes and value of PTA. This includes individuals who do not have children, to parents and guardians of non-public school students, to members of the community, and of course yourselves as policymakers. And on a note of being a policymaker, annually the Free State PTA develops a legislative agenda of which I hope you've received access. The PTA mission is to make every child's potential a reality by engaging and empowering families and communities to advocate for all children. I'd like to share with you just a few legislative bills we're supporting in Annapolis. House Bill 185, Non-Public Schools and Child Care Providers, Corporal Punishment Prohibition. House Bill 24, Sales and Use Tax, Musical Instruments Exemption. Senate Bill 120, Public Schools, Anaphylactic Food Allergies Guidelines. County Boards of Education, Due Process Proceedings for Children with Disabilities, Burden of Proof, House Bill 294, Youth Equity and Safety Act, the YEST Act, which you'll hear a lot about on Thursday, Senate Bill 93. I want to thank you for supporting public schools and public education here in Maryland, and we invite, we invite you to... Thank you. Our next speaker is Nick Ardris from BCPS OPE. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Chair uh, Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Deputy Yarborough, and Dr. Williams, and board members. I'm here tonight on behalf of OPE organization to recognize our professional employees who are the engine behind our school system's operation. We all recognize that our employees are the most valued resource 
and are grateful for, for their hard work and dedication. Please show your commitment to them during this budget cycle allocation by first providing an adequate, adequate annual cost of living adjustments, which is critical to keeping up during these inflationary times. In addition, maintaining competitive compensation will enable the school system to retain current employees and attract new ones. Secondly, employee training opportunities are absolutely vital to the continued success of BCPS. Please allow adequate budget allocations to fund professional certifications and staff development. Having well-trained employees creates a more effective and a high quality workforce. Creating an opportunity for open and honest dialogue always facilitates better outcomes, resulting in more effective organization. We want to share our appreciation for Dr. Williams' vision to create UPED. This collaborative team model enabled all BCPS union presidents and executive directors to work closely with him and his leadership team, allowing each union to have a shared voice on issues facing the school system. The UPED collaboration with the superintendent and his staff served the school, school system very well. The UPED model should definitely continue in the future. Finally, our organization thanks Dr. Williams for his support and we wish him success as he pursues new endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ryan Coleman from the NAACP of Randallstown. Mr. Coleman. Good evening, uh, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, uh, board members, and Dr. Williams. Glad to be here via virtual Zoom. I wanted to comment a little bit on the stakeholder groups um, and whether or not they should remain the same. Communication with the public is an essential component in the operation of the public school system. For years, Baltimore County Public Schools afforded the citizens of Baltimore County an opportunity to communicate as stakeholder groups in an orderly fashion in the Board of Education meetings. This action not only increased citizen involvement, but has helped in keep minority and other groups from being marginalized, disenfranchised, and basically forgotten. The recent pandemic has made participation difficult at times. However, this is no excuse to eliminate the stakeholder session of the board meetings. I would ask the board to be mindful that we didn't get rid of limited public engagement because people, <clears throat> because people uh, do not act as we find convenient. People need a venue in which to express their opinions and concerns in an orderly fashion. The stakeholder portion of the board enables various organizations to be represented consistently as it stands now, the stakeholder segment increases the order of the board meeting and decreases the chances for disruption. During the stakeholder session, organizations present information that they decided as a group or even voted on to, to be present. Knowing the above and how the stakeholder segments at the board meetings were developed in an effort to keep the public involved, it would be wrong to eliminate this longstanding tradition at board meetings. Recently, the school system has been criticized for its limited or downright lack of communication with the public. To remove the stakeholder opportunity would only make matters worse. There was never a rule that the stakeholder groups had to be present. They were always recognized. To get rid of that segment could be perceived as almost punitive. In fulfilling its fiduciary role, it is the responsibility of the board to enable opportunities for public involvement, not to disminish them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cindy Sexton from TAPCO. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Yarborough, members of the board. Educators are not feeling the love today. Thousands of us wore our red in solidarity for realistic compensation, but so far the only thing that has been presented in the current budget is one step. One step which also gives nothing to our most veteran educators who are at the top of the salary scale. I hope you saw the red for ed pictures on social media and I know you received emails from educators as well. 
As I said, we aren't feeling the love. We are angry. We are wondering why our counterparts in other counties are getting colas of four, five, and 6%, and currently we have no cola. This is not the way to recruit and retain educators. I don't know how to make it any clearer than I have. Our students need educators. We aren't going to fix any academic or any other concerns without them. And while yes, there is a national shortage, we need to do better to get the educators here and keep them here. BCPS, we need to show our educators that we truly want them in our system. And that starts with compensation that increases our career earnings. The salary compression that we agreed to last year needs to come to fruition this year. Waiting and kicking it down the road does not serve our students. Will tough choices need to be made to find the money? Yes. But as I have said before, if we look at the budget and ask, how does this help our students? I'm certain we can find the money to keep our educators in our system. If we truly want a strong system and BCPS graduates who are productive members of society, we need to invest in them, in our students, for their futures and the future of all of us. Let's start with keeping our educators by finding the money for this salary compression. It can be the first step in showing our educators that we want them, we need them, and we'll do the work and find the money. Our students deserve it. Thank you. Thank you. Next is general public comment, and our first speaker is Jesse Yeager. Good evening. Good evening. First of all, I want to acknowledge and thank BCPS Board Chair Lichter, Board Member Dominowski for their responses regarding Hampton. We have been told you are looking into it. I truly am grateful, considering it was way more communication than we had three years ago. However, I was pretty miffed when I received a correspondence stating that BCPS maintains transparency and engages the community for input. If BCPS were truly transparent, why were we never given an answer as to why Hampton was the only school included in the boundary change of 2020? And why did no one listen when we said to look at the facts, not the numbers fabricated by BCPS? I sat here three years ago saying what would happen if you did not include more schools in the boundary study. Actually, there were many of us, and yet nothing was done. Nothing was changed to include community input, and here we are. Exactly what we said would happen has happened. We have been told you are looking into it. Thank you. I want a timeline. I want to know that you are pushing this to the top of your priorities and making sure a solution is reached before the end of this school year to be implemented for next school year. And trailers are not an acceptable solution. I want to know that you are willing to own up to your mistakes and move forward eager to change things for the better. The problem is, it seems like BCPS is apt at repeating mistakes. At the middle school boundary study last week, there was a list of elementary schools and what middle schools they feed into. It was wrong. Hampton feeds into four middle schools, not three, with Pine Grove being the school that was left off the list. Our boundary is so big, we have students coming all the way from Parkville. And the fact that that was omitted in a boundary study is beyond negligent. Another slide was shown with the change of student enrollment from September 30th to February 1st. Some schools did not have much of a change. However, Dumbarton had an increase of 32 kids. Yet the presenter stated that it was a negligible number of students and therefore using September 30th enrollment was accurate and acceptable. 32 kids is not a negligible number. And for an elementary school, that is more than an entire class. Hampton has added 40 students since September 30th. Nothing close to acceptable. An overcrowded school is not raising the bar. It is definitely not closing any gaps. We cannot allow failures of the past to dictate actions of today. Otherwise, we fail to move the bar. Now is the time to make changes. Now is the time to work with the county 
and come up with a better system of predicting and monitoring student enrollment. Now is the time to bring change to Baltimore County Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christine Phillips. Good evening, my name is Christine Phillips. I'm a fifth year Spanish teacher at Woodlawn High School and I am an outlier. A little less than half of the teacher workforce leaves within their first five years. I intend to keep teaching, but the budget needs to show me that you wanna keep me here. I live in Baltimore City. A friend who's a fourth year English teacher in the city and only has a bachelor's degree makes $67,336 a year. I have a master's degree and one more year of experience and make $62,000 a year. Despite being the third largest school system in the state, BCPS salaries are not competitive. Without a sizable investment in your educator workforce, the system will continue to lose experienced educators to other districts. Now, let's zoom in on my classroom for just a moment. My Spanish language and culture honor students are halfway through unit three, where they are asked to think about their role in the world. We just finished talking about the Mirabal sisters, Dominican activists who resisted Rafael Trujillo's regime in the 1950s and were eventually assassinated for speaking out. This is often the first time my students have been exposed to Caribbean history beyond enslavement and maybe the Haitian Revolution. They need context to understand the lives of Patria, Dede, Minerva, and Maria Teresa Mirabal. But my students often remind me that this isn't history class. This is the third year I've taught this version of the curriculum, and each time I feel like I get a little closer to the perfect balance of historical context, student interest, and Spanish vocabulary and grammar. Were my lessons perfect this year? No, but I know that they were 10 times better than the 2021 versions. Two more years of experience makes a world of difference. My students deserve more fifth year teachers like me. Educators who are comfortable with their content, willing to take risks and even fail for the sake of their students' learning. In an analysis of 30 studies about teacher effectiveness, Kinney and Podolsky found that more experienced teachers support greater student learning for their colleagues and the school as a whole, as well as for their own students. Now, I'd like to teach you a little Spanish. My shirt says, in nuestras manos está el cambio. In inglés es, Change is in our hands. You, the Board of Education, have the power to change Dr. Williams' budget. In tus manos está el cambio. You have the power to keep experienced educators who serve as role models for our students in BCPS. Fund our salary scale compression to increase career earnings and better recruit and retain great educators. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brent Sewell. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to address the board. I'm the father of a child at Hampton Elementary School. While my son is only in kindergarten, we've been in Hampton for over two years now. At three years old, my nonverbal son began his IEP at Hamptons for speech and OT services. And this past October, my son, who's made remarkable gains, was able to shed that IEP. My wife and I are truly grateful for the individual attention he received at Hampton Elementary School during that time. This year, I volunteered every month to assist his teacher during one of her learning activities. My son's kindergarten class is one of six at Hampton and has 27 students. During my visits, I act as reinforcement for my son's teachers in implementing her particular lesson plan for that day and each time I help anywhere from eight to 12 students that need help in completing the particular task at hand. My son's teacher, who's trying her absolute best, is just unable to keep up with the sheer number of students that need the additional help during the particular activity. On my last visit, she mentioned that seven students were absent earlier in the week and how nice it was to have a manageable class size for just that one day. While my son attended both the threes programs in pre-K at Hampton, during, uh, due to his IEP, we were unaware of the capacity issues at Hampton. My son's threes program had five children in it, 
and his pre-K class size was 17 with both a full-time teacher and a teaching aide. At our PTA meeting last week, our school principal has already advised that there are three classrooms short for next year. Talks of trailers and potentially repurposing the music slash art room were presented as options. The parents of Hampton Elementary School will not accept trailers as a solution for this problem when larger talks of school expansion are not on the table. Hampton's capacity issues have forced my wife and I to make the heartbreaking decision to enroll our son in a local private school for next year, and it feels like we're turning our back on both the school and a community that's done so much for us. While a boundary study has been proposed as a potential solution, it's also not a guarantee. After seeing firsthand how beneficial smaller class size has been for my particular family, I urge, to, I urge this board to consider the overcrowding issue for not only Hampton Elementary, but also Baltimore County Schools in general. I know that we at Hampton are not alone in regards to this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dana Bergman. Ms. Bergman. Greetings, board members and Superintendent Dr. Williams, Team BCPS leaders, and my all-time favorite mob squad. I would like to welcome the new board members to the first ever Board of Ed history class with parent professor Diana Bergman. Ms. Bergman is our nation's most recognized parent by superintendents from coast to coast. One, two, three, board members, eyes on me. Let's take our note-taking tools out and turn our listening ears on. The first lesson of today is regarding the $1.1 million contract and WE80223 for an additional 9,000 square footage of storage for educational records for BCPS students. The objective in today's lesson plan is to identify a long-term solution to our cry, these educational records in a feasible and responsible manner in the best interest of our taxpayer dollars. While the previous board felt it was absolutely necessary to store excessive amount of educational records, the previous board failed to recommend an effective archive system to locate students' educational records. Please use board docs as a tool to help identify the historic timeline of the famous let's keep everything without storage capacity. When students leave BCPS, their educational records get requested by outside school districts. Two school years have gone by, and parent Professor Bergman is still patiently waiting for these expensively stored educational records to make its way across the country. California love. Extra credit, extra credit, extra credit. Where are all my mathematicians at? Please problem solve the following question. Why spent $2.5 million on transportation camera tracking device when it could have been done for free? Huh. This wasn't a BCPS decision or a superintendent decision. This was a board of ed decision. Solve for extra credit and win one of many expensive battles ahead. Thank you. All assignments are due by the end of the quarter. Please email parent Professor Bergman for any additional questions and feedback. Enjoy your day and happy Valentine's Day, Baltimore County. Bye. I love you. Thank, thank you. Our next speaker is Taylor Boren. Good evening. My name is Taylor Boren. I am a proud graduate of Baltimore County Public Schools and currently in my eighth year as a BCPS art teacher. I recognize that current policies make it difficult for school board members to actually visit schools. So I want to start by painting you a picture of some of the things happening in my classroom. In third grade, we're studying insects. Students aren't just drawing bugs though. They're learning about insect symbolism in other cultures. They're making connections to math as they draw and cut complex symmetrical shapes. They're building science vocabulary when they label and describe the parts of an insect. My fifth graders are applying what they've learned about architecture by sketching and building models of their ideal school. They want a school that has a coding lab, better lunches, and more classrooms so that they can be in the school building instead of in trailers. <laughs> I am also currently a mentor for a student teacher who is experiencing elementary school for the first time as a teacher. I am guiding her as she learns how to teach kindergartners to paint 
and fourth graders to sculpt with clay. I'm helping her understand how to navigate challenging behaviors and integrate social emotional learning into her teaching and planning. Since the start of February, I have worked over 10 hours of unpaid time so that I could make these things possible for my intern and my students. And I'm sure there are a lot of educators right now thinking only 10 hours? In elementary school, we often talk about whether choices are helpful or hurtful. Well, the BCPS, the budget BCPS is proposing for next school year is hurtful. It includes no COLA. There is no effort to implement the compressed salary scale or move toward the blueprint mandated starting salary of $60,000 a year. Adjusted for inflation, educators are taking a pay cut. In a county with numerous unfilled vacancies, a persistent sub shortage, and thousands of educators working countless unpaid hours every week, why would you pass a budget like this? Why would you pass any budget that doesn't put the schoolhouse and the educators within it first? I am dedicated to my students, my practice, and the necessity of strong public education, but that isn't enough to save me from burnout. I am here to ask you for a budget that recognizes teaching conditions or learning conditions. I am here to ask you for a budget that dignifies the work of educators and support professionals. I am here to ask you, for a, ask you to fund salary scale compression to increase career earnings and to better recruit and retain great educators. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jean Milston. Milstein. Good evening. Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Yarborough, and members of the board. My name is Jenny Milstein, and I am a paraeducator in a comprehensive high school. Imagine for a moment that you're working in a classroom. A student walks in, immediately goes to the back of the room, pulls their hoodie strings up tight, puts their head down on their desk, and falls asleep. When roused, they confess that they were evicted last night, and they are starving and exhausted. English class is not their priority. You talk to the student, give them a granola bar, and contact, connect them to the social worker and counseling. None of this is your fault. It's not the student's fault either, but it becomes, in part, your problem. You use your tools, listen to what the student needs, and collaborate so the student can get the resources that they need in order to be successful in the classroom. Board of Education. Much of this current situation is not your fault. It is not your fault that inflation is at historic levels. It's not your fault that the proposed budget falls short of expectations. But I would argue it is, in part, your problem, just as it is the educators. We need to work together to fix this budget. Did you know that it can take a support professional upwards of 31 years to earn a subsistence wage with this county? We need a budget that recognizes the dedication of current employees by paying us what we are worth. We need a budget that provides enough full-time staffing to the offices of benefits and certification so that these offices run smoothly, not piecemeal solutions that voluntarily shuffle staff from one office to another. We need a budget that funds salary scale compression to increase career earnings to better recruit and retain great educators. Let us work together to create a budget that works. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Makita Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Makita Scott, and I live in Baltimore County, Owings Mills. I would like to acknowledge first Chair Jean Lichter, Vice Chair Robin Harvey, Dr. Brenda Savoy, the fourth district, and I'd also like to recognize appointed board member, Ms. Molly Joes, Superintendent Dr. Darrell Williams, and Dr. Miriam Yarborough, who is sitting in today for Dr. Williams. Thank you all for your commitment to our children. As I said earlier, my name is Makita Scott. And I am here to speak with you all today. I spoke at the last board meeting about historical appropriateness in our curriculum and making sure that our students have the opportunity to have access to a diverse education 
that is reflective of the population of our community, our schools, our parents, our kids, and quite frankly, the rest of the country. Again, I would like to reiterate that history is American history, and American history is the history of us all. It is not owned by a particular person, a particular group, and it's not through the lens of um, how we might uh, appear for it to be. It's just history. It's direct history, and it's something that we all have access to. I feel it's something that we should ensure that our children continue to have the opportunity to learn about. They deserve to learn about differences in each other and differences in themselves. Learning about differences in each other creates a stronger knowledge base and a stronger base of learning. And that is needed indeed. We want for our children to have the best platform from which to spring. So I thank you all for the opportunity to speak, for the opportunity to share with you my viewpoints as a parent, as a community member. And I would like to thank everyone who is here today for coming, for sharing your views. I'd like to thank the board for your willingness to listen to our concerns and to be partners with us in the community and for the work that you do maintaining your compass and goal to keep children first and foremost in your thoughts and your work as you go forward. So I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak before the board. I do hope that I will have more opportunities to come back again through the public speaking option. I thank you all very much and I hope you all have a good evening. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Our next speaker is Claire Huckenpoler. I apologize if I just okay. met. Will you tell me what it is? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> this one? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Is it working? Okay. Hello. My name is Claire Huckenpoller, and I am a special educator at Lansdowne Elementary School. I'm also a graduate of the Baltimore County Public School System. BCPS was great to me as a student. I received a quality education from devoted, passionate, and highly skilled teachers. When I chose to leave my job working at Kennedy Krieger Schools and come to BCPS after seven years, I was excited to give back to the school system that helped make me who I am today. I was confident that BCPS would do right by me as an educator, as it had for so many years as a student. Unfortunately, that is not the case. In September 2021, an efficacy study revealed that HR was extremely inefficient and needed to be fixed. More than a year later, and after TABCO pushing yet again, Dr. Williams promised to fix HR issues in December 2022. It is now February 2023, and I'm here to talk to you about how the BCPS HR department is still failing its employees. When I signed my contract with BCPS in July 2021, I was told that I would be entering on master's step 10 and my entire previous employment history had been verified. So at the start of the school year, I was shocked to discover that opting for 12 month pay resulted in me bringing home less money each paycheck than I did at my previous job almost three years ago. Upon closer inspection, I realized that my salary rate is two steps lower than it should be. Anxious about my finances, but hopeful for a quick resolution, I reached out to my HR representative, attaching her email from when I was first hired, which stated my employment history had been verified and quoting my salary. That was September 2nd, 2022. It's now February, 2023, and I'm still not being paid correctly, and a resolution is nowhere in sight. I'm a single, financially responsible, working professional, professional with an advanced degree in her early 30s, and I am currently living paycheck to paycheck, and that's with 10 years of teaching experience. I don't own a home. I don't have significant amounts of student debt. I don't go on lavish trips or drive a fancy car. I'm not in this career for the money, and for all, by all accounts, I'm making all the right choices, choices that BCPS taught me to make. I'm in this career because I love what I do, and I want to make a difference. I would simply like to be able to save money for my future at the same time. I'm asking BCPS to do right by me and pay me the correct salary and compensate me for what I'm owed. 
I'm asking you to address the systemic inefficiencies in the HR department so educators like me don't have to continue to spend valued planning time and duty-free lunch time sending emails to HR and making phone calls to this new customer help department instead of preparing what my students need. Finally, I'm asking you to fully fund the salary scale compression to increase career earnings so that BCPS Thank you. Our next speaker is Bosch Ferron. Good evening. Happy, good evening. Happy Valentine. You are my love. <laughs> 25 years. Letting go, Dr. Williams, will not really help the students of BCPS. It is a band-aid. Letting him go because of lack of leadership, lack of communication with the public, is really disingenuous. Dr. Williams is your employee. Let us not sacrifice the horse when the rider is the cause. Dr. Williams cannot really do what Bob Iger, CEO of Disney, does. He cannot reward effective employees. He cannot really let go employees to make the system more efficient. He cannot do a whole lot of things because he has more than 20 bosses between Annapolis and Towson. This system, I believe, over my 25 years of watching it, is really doomed for failure. Notice that no board member leaves and come back. No student board member come back except, I believe, Christian Thomas. I haven't really seen alumni come in back and really put into the system. And I have heard so many complaints from the public, as you heard today. You, the Board of Education, have no control on the budget. You cannot collect taxes. Even the surplus money that comes from your approved budget, you have to return it back. You cannot really put it in a place where you think it's most appropriate. You are not in control. So, what am I saying? Parents are really concerned about overcrowding, lack of discipline in students. They are concerned about the effectiveness of the teacher population and teachers leaving. They are concerned about other issues related to the performance of the school system and lack of transparency, answering parents. So, why am I saying this? Our students is the only product, and they are going to compete with a huge number of excellent Chinese and Indian students coming into the business in here in the U.S. and outside. This is the product that we need to focus on, and you cannot do it unless you are in control of the budget. I ask you to consider levying taxes separate from Baltimore County, separate from the state. So you can meet the demands. That's the only way. Thank you. Our final speaker is Kristen Nielsen. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. My name is Kristen Nielsen. I am both a graduate of Baltimore County Public Schools and Baltimore County's Teacher of the Year in 2019. I teach reading at Crossroads Center, and I'm here to ask for more for my students and colleagues. We at Crossroads found out last year on Teacher Appreciation Monday that our program was ending. 19 educators decided to leave our school. Some left the profession we're still only staffed for our previous program and are missing the support positions essential to students' well-being and academic success. Why deny students what they need to succeed? 
you, the board, do have this power to prioritize what matters. Last year, over 1,400 educators left Baltimore County. For too long, we BCPS educators have seen our lack of value. A step was skipped during COVID. Last year, when Social Security gave an 8% COLA, we BCPS educators had to fight for 1.5%. As was said, it was a pay decrease. Anne Arundel County is currently offering a 6% COLA this year. Last year, BCPS and the board both agreed to the collapse salary scale. Let's please bring this back. This would help our early career educators get closer to a living wage and the $60,000 starting salary required by the Blueprint for Progress. I've taught for 20 years with a master's plus 30. If I changed districts, I would earn 7,500 more per year in Howard County, 15,000 more per year in PG County, and 24,000 more in Montgomery County. You, the board, do have the power to show students, educators, and paraeducators that we matter to you. Our county executive is making $17,000 more than he made last year. Every director makes at least $102,000 more than I do. Every coordinator, $54,000 more. Every supervisor, $46,000 more. BCPS has 286 directors, coordinators, and supervisors, 167 more than PG County, the second biggest in the state. Selected professional staff in BCPS is also more than double that of PG. 466 to 212. Our paraeducators are even more deserving of raises, though it's not just about the money. I've been fighting a migraine for three weeks. I too have been spending about three hours per afternoon after school several days a week. Two educators left our school in the profession already this year. This workload's not sustainable. Please support us. We deserve more than survival. We in our Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report, and for that I call Dr. Yarbrough on behalf of Dr. Williams. Thank you. Good evening. Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board. I'm pleased to present Dr. Williams' superintendent report to the board and team BCPS. This report includes celebrations, updates, and evidence of our strategic plan in action. I'll begin by saying happy Valentine's Day to all. We know that our efforts to heal, rebuild, and recover must be ongoing. We will continue to move forward to meet the needs of team BCPS. That is why there is a renewed focus on academic achievement and partnerships in BCPS. We know that this very important work cannot be done alone. Thank you for your, your support of the system. We are pleased to announce the opening of the Employee and Retiree Customer Service Center on the Greenwood campus to respond daily to employee and retiree needs. Walk-in, email, and phone support is provided Monday through Friday with extended hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Our center is staffed with 12 full-time customer service representatives, six part-time representatives, and one supervisor to ensure that we are responding in real time to employee and retiree needs. Let's take a look at the opening. We are with Baltimore County Public Schools, and today we are having our ribbon cutting ceremony. We are very excited to have our new customer service center. And um, we're located on Greenwood Building B, 
and we are here to assist all of our active and retirees to give them the best customer service we possibly can. We are here to support them in any way necessary and when you call in or even when you walk in it is very important that we leave you with a lasting impression everything that all your issues that you come here to be taken care of if you are an active employee if you have any problem with benefits with payroll with leave fmla attendance you can come in and we will help you make a ticket through the BCPS serve system. If you need to make an appointment, you'll also get a ticket so you can track when your appointment is. We also will be able to help our retirees with any kind of benefit issues or concerns that they have to make sure that we are serving them in the best possible way. Uh, we're very excited that this is open. We have members who have been concerned and have problems that need to be resolved and we're just excited that there's finally a time and a place for them to come in person and be able to do that. I feel this is very important for the employees. Now they have a place that they can come and talk to someone face to face if they like, or to call them on the phone and be able to get their process uh, started for retirement. And employees who have present uh, problems or conversations, they can have them here. Our families need this service. We need to be able to come to a space, resolve our issues, and this is what this center is all about. So I'm very excited about it. I think it was just uh, the, the right thing to do for um, the school system and uh, we're really appreciative and our, all our employees will be appreciative uh, to have this center operational. We were all at the table collaborating and problem solving about what was in the best interest of Team BCPS and we all settled on a one-stop shop and so here you have it, the Employee and Retiree Customer Service Center. On each school day during the month of uh, February, Black History Month, we are honoring a Team BCPS graduate. Today, meet Victor Blackwell, a Milford Mill Academy graduate and CNN anchor and correspondent. For the BCPS 2023 haiku contest, each student is invited to choose from 10 pieces of artwork and write a haiku inspired by that artwork. Entries will be accepted from Thursday, February the 16th through 4.45 p.m. on Thursday, March the 2nd. Please join me in congratulating Stacy Nunn, Library Media Specialist at Wynan Elementary School. She was named finalist for the 2023 Maryland School Librarian of the Year. February is Career and Technical Education Month and the perfect time for BCPS TV to launch its new T CTE show. Please go to our website and tune in to the show. The CTE premiere show is available for all to view. Last week, the Maryland State Department of Education released final data from the spring 2022 administration of Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program, MCAP, in English Language Arts and Mathematics. We are pleased that we saw gains with some grade levels in English Language Arts, but there is much more work to be done. Students across the state are struggling to recover to pre-pandemic levels of performance, especially in mathematics, and Baltimore County Public Schools is no different. It is clear that we must do something differently to recover lost learning. As Dr. Williams shared in his message to BCPS, we have committed to both short-term and long-term goals. In the short term, we will reevaluate pacing guides with assessment topics to ensure that all students have an opportunity to learn and master standards prior to the spring assessment. Central offices will cluster schools according to performance outcomes and provide differentiated support with pacing and professional learning to create short-term action plans based on specific student needs. Schools will offer targeted tutoring support for students in need of additional practice. In long-term, we are going to identify students who need structured summer support to improve achievement and strongly recommend attendance to families. We will also review 
English language arts and mathematic curriculum pacing guides and district assessments and revise items as needed to provide students with multiple opportunities for mastery and the ability to demonstrate feedback. Finally, we are convening an ELA and mathematics stakeholder group for feedback on needed changes to program offerings and limited areas of focus for a 2023-2024 school year. We're pleased to announce that Team BCPS students took 10,306 AP exams last year. This was an increase of more than 2,300 tests from the previous year. In addition to gains in participation, students also improved in, in a performance. 64.5% of those exams received a score of three or higher. This was an increase of 3.1 percentage points. Congratulations to all of our AP test takers. The proposed budget focuses on strengthening our course and shaping our future. We know that delivering on this commitment means prioritizing investment in the most critical components now to ensure success moving forward. Our people are truly are critical to our success. The commitment and advocacy of members of TB Team BCPS who are here this evening is truly appreciated. The FY24 operating budget ensures that we begin implementing Blueprint for Maryland's future. It also includes cost reductions to help fund FY 2023 compensation enhancements, compensation step increases for all eligible employees, and with board support, we are actively working to negotiate with all employee associations for the 2024 cost of living allowances. Part of this will be offset by budgetary efficiencies. Please stay tuned for additional information regarding the FY24 budget. We will continue to update the board, our community, and Team BCPS. We thank you for your support. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the chair report. And I want to use my board report to provide acknowledgments and thanks, starting with Ms. Gover. Changes to public participation at BOE meetings was approved during our last meeting. Implementation of those changes began with tonight's meeting due to Ms. Gover's work on ensuring that the changes were made and used to prepare for tonight. The updated procedures can be found on our website. But thank you, Ms. Gover. It went very smoothly due to your diligence and your work. I'd also. I'd also like to thank our four currently appointed board members, Mr. Kuhn, Dr. Hager, Mr. Offerman, and Ms. Joes. I realize that your tenure on the board is lasting longer than you may have anticipated, but I truly appreciate your continued commitment to BCPS. I am learning that there are a lot of aspects involved in the role of board member. Visiting schools and interacting with administrators, staff, and students is, and I think will always be the best part of being a BCPS BOE member. I'd like to thank Principal Brown at Woodmore Elementary School for giving me a crash course in what it means to be one of our two primary IB schools. I want to thank Principal Griffin at Powhatan Elementary School for providing me her perspective on what it means to be a second year principal in BCPS and how she is working to build the capacity of her staff, which has included a large number of untenured teachers. I'd like to thank Principal Webster at Featherbed Lane Elementary School for showing me how a principal's unwavering determination can transform a school community. I'd like to thank Principal Archelise at Woodlawn Middle School for allowing her students to tell the story of Woodlawn Middle School and why they value their time there. There was one young man I met who had transferred to Woodlawn Middle from Carroll County. He spoke so openly to me about what it meant to him to attend a school where he felt represented. Representation matters, and his words spoke volumes to me. And I'd also like to thank Principal Workmeister at Camfield Early Learning Center for making certain that I met with her reading specialist, where I could feel and hear the excitement of the progress they are making to ensure that our youngest students are receiving the foundational skills 
they need to be lifelong successful readers and writers. While we have much work to be done, there are wonderful things taking place in our schools and wonderful staff making it happen. So on behalf of the board, thank you to the principals who are continuing to take their time out of their visit, very busy days to walk and talk with all of us and show off their prides and joys. And lastly, during my chair reports, I will provide updates on the superintendent's search where appropriate. Immediately following our last board meeting an, ad hoc committee meeting, an ad hoc committee was formed to begin the process. I'd like to thank the Office of Purchasing for working quickly with the ad hoc committee to post an RFP for search firms to submit their proposals. The RFP was posted the second week of February, and the deadline is February 17th. And that includes the chair's report. Next is the student member's report, and for that I call on Ms. Hassan. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. Um, first off, I'd like to wish um, everyone a very happy Valentine's Day. Um, today we celebrate by showing love not only to one another, but to our community as well and acting upon it. Today, my act of love and passion comes in the manifest itself in a mental health resolution. Um, board members, you have this in your inbox, so I ask that you please reference that. Um, but in the meantime, um, this resolution comes from an immense amount of research, due diligence, and true passion. Board members, we are in a crisis. We are in an immense amount of need. We can no longer deny the impact of these past few years on our students and our staff. Our mental well-being is essential to guaranteeing that we are addressing school safety concerns, that we are addressing our staffing concerns, that we are addressing academic concerns, all of which is integral to how our school system functions. So um, while I would serenade you with statistics, which I'm sure you're all aware of, um, I'd actually like to just read you all my resolution and open up space for discussion um, with a motion and amendment, but I'd like to read it to you all first. Okay, resolution, mental health, Board of Education of Baltimore County, whereas the safety and well-being of Baltimore County public school students and staff, well, I'll amend that. No, I won't. Yes, I will. I'm so confused. Okay. Whereas the safety and well-being of Baltimore County public school students is a high priority of the Board of Education of Baltimore County Board, and whereas the board prioritizes school safety as integral to school climate and student success and acknowledges that mental health is at the core of school safety and climate, and whereas increased mental health supports for BCPS students and staff are crucial in supporting young people within our school communities navigate a plethora of complex social emotional issues, and whereas mental health is a prevalent challenge for many youth, but is often misunderstood by educators and student peers, and research from the National Alliance on Mental Health shows that one in five youth experience mental health issues, and whereas rates of mental health issues, specifically depression, in youth aged 12 to 17 have drastically risen within the last 10 years, according to the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and whereas school psychologists, social workers, counselors, and personnel are critical to supporting the needs of students, and BCPS will, will strive to meet the American School Counselor Association recommendation ratio of at least one counselor for every 250 students, and whereas BCPS students and staff have experienced an increase in mental health struggles since the COVID-19 pandemic, and the, and the resources allotted must transform with the ever-changing needs of students and staff. Therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education herewith assembled in regular session on the 14th day of February in the year 2023 shall create a mental health, wellness, and school safety work group tasked with developing recommendations for a new board policy on mental wellness and existing policy as related to mental health and safety as determined by the work group and be it further resolved that the student member of the board, including and following the 2022 to 23 student member, will serve as a member of such a work group with the chair of, of the work group to be appointed by the board chair and be it further resolved that the board will consider any and all recommendations from such work group and consequently work alongside the superintendent, the Office of Student Support Services, partner organizations in developing long-term solutions to significantly 
improve mental health services in Baltimore County's K through 12 public schools and be further resolved. The board prioritizes equitable access and pre-existing mental health resources for students and staff as best recommended by experts in the field and be it further resolved that the board commit to the provision of widespread and accessible resources towards mental health support and wellness for students and staff alike and seek out sound fiscal opportunity to do so. So that is the resolution that I have sent to you all. Um, I know there is a motion in the chat. Um, yes, Madam yes. Chair. Yes, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Ms. Hassan. Um, well, I, thank you, Ms. Hassan, for making this motion. Um, seeing that the board received this during closed session and have not had chance to review it, um, I move to postpone this item to the next board meeting on 228 so that board members have a chance to review the resolution in advance of the meeting and can prepare for a robust discussion. Is there a second on Ms. Hager. Hen? Oh, Ms. Hager, Dr. Okay. Dr. Hager seconded. May we have a roll call vote? Actually, may I speak to that? Oh, is there any discussion? I'm sorry. May I speak to that, yes, please? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, I, while I respect the motion to postpone, the resolution is respectfully one and a quarter pages. Um, I understand that you guys had limited time to review this, um, but I also understand that um, we've had motions and we've had resolutions proposed to us incredibly last minute um, within maybe minutes um, of being proposed. So um, frankly, I think that this resolution is straightforward. I think we can we have the capacity and the ability to discuss um, such a resolution. And I, I frankly think that we do have the time and the capacity to sit and discuss this resolution within the time allotted within my student member report. So while I understand um, the yearn to, um, to postpone this, um, I also understand that we are in a crisis and that the longer we wait, um, the, you know, the less time we have to create such a work group. Um, and I also understand that you know, the, the second half of this resolution, the be it therefore resolved, is to create a work group. And I believe that it is an incredibly straightforward resolution. I believe that we can discuss and amend this. And I believe that we have the capacity to do so on the spot because we have done it before. So I, I frankly think that it is essential that we discuss it now. Thank Madam you. Chair, may I speak Ms. to my motion? Yes, Ms. Hen, you may speak to your motion. Thank you. Um, so I only had about 30 seconds during close to look over um, this, and I doubt any of my colleagues had a chance to look at this, um, which is my main concern. However, when I did read it, there were two concerns that um, immediately jumped out at me. One, the resolution creates a policy. Um, we have a current wellness policy that incorporates mental health and wellness, um, and is very specific about providing resources to every school. Um, for student mental health and wellness. Um, that's one concern is where, how is this unique rather than expanding on our existing policy, which the policy review committee spent quite a lot of time um, addressing just recently. So that was one concern that immediately jumped out at me. A second is that um, one of the clauses um, states that the board prioritizes equitable access in, pre -ex in allocating pre-existing mental health resources for students and staff as best recommended by experts in the field. Uh, my concern is that that might mean schools and, and as follows, their students and staff will lose access to existing mental health resources by reallocating pre-existing resources. So I just have a lot of questions and concerns. Again, I haven't had time to review this, neither have my colleagues. So I would ask for your support in pressing pause. We meet again in two weeks. We can all review it and have a robust discussion then. And I'm sure Chair Lichter would support adding it to the agenda. So thank you. Dr. Hager, did you want to respond to your second motion? Um, yes, I also just had a brief opportunity to look it over um, before we discussed it. And I sent an email to, um, to the student member and the chair and vice chair, just to say that we do have a local school health council that's already mandated in state law that addresses much of the same issues that this work group would, would address. Um, and I have a number of resources and, and, and opportunities that we could discuss further had we seen it um, more than a few minutes before the, this discussion. And I, I, would, I do also share the concern that it's du duplicative of the local school health council 
Um, and so again, I'm happy to, to expand, but I just would love to have another two weeks to hone in on how this is unique or how it could work with the local school health council. Um, and the leadership of that local school health council is not here today. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Thank you. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Um, so later on this evening, we're going to get a lot of motions that's going to be actually having fiscal impacts, and we'll be asked to vote on it without consideration at nine ten o'clock. Um, and we we make those decisions, but actually has fiscal impact. So I find this um, this resolution in pretty straightforward. It seems to be reinforcing our current policies. And Ms. Hassan, you have ran this by our PRC staff, staff liaison, Ms. Howie, correct? And if you could respond back to your resolution, the way I see just reinforces our current student mental health uh, resolution. Okay, Ms. Hassan. Is that correct? Yeah, so um, I have um, reached out to Ms. Howie. Um, we actually spent days reviewing this, ensuring that um, this held up um, with PRC and with existing policy. So um, I do want to clarify, and in the language of the resolution, it does, you know, prioritize the creation um, of, you know, the work group. And I understand that we do have. Um, resources that are provided within BCPS, but I also understand that it is nowhere near enough and it is not entirely localized. Um, while it is localized and we do have some of those resources, it is also essential that we have you know, an additional amount of, of resources and, and truly hone in on, on addressing those policy issues. So I, I do understand concerns with policy, um, but to correct any misconceptions, oh, I don't know if I can keep going. Yeah, let me finish my sentence. Um, so um, in regards to policy, um, I understand that these are recommendations that if necessary, and as mentioned in the language, um, the work group would create or would assist in creating recommendations to create a new policy as well as amend existing policy. Um, and in response to the Thank reallocation you. of resources, it does not state reallocating, it states equitably allocating. Ms. Harvey, you had a question? Yes, thank you. Uh, I appreciate, uh, Ms. Hassan, your focus on uh, student well-being and mental health. I'm reviewing policy 5470, and I'm wondering how the resolution aligns with that or uh, is parallel to that policy regarding services to students around wellness. So, um, Mr. Bersades, does she have time to respond to Answering the questions? N not as part of this motion. Our, not our as time part. Has expired. Okay. Um, Miss Dr. Hager, you had a, another comment. Um, yes. Again, I'm, I'm less worried about the policy comment, but um, more so the, the just misalignment with the existing infrastructure. And so I, I think it could just be polished a bit. And I know that Miss Howley looked at at the um, at the the document, but I don't believe anyone from the local school health council was involved in this process. And I don't know if Mr. Scriven or someone might be there tonight or Ms. Uh, Somerville, but there are a lot of folks um, involved in the local school health council. And I think it could be a great opportunity as opposed to trying to get this through tonight. It's only two weeks away. And I think that we could make this a lot stronger and more effective given the existing infrastructure. Thank you. Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, I agree with Dr. Hager's comments in looking at policy and rule 5470. The, there are clauses within this resolution that seem to be contradictory. Again, we didn't have time to review this thoroughly or ask questions of Ms. Howie. So I say that um, just with that um, caveat, it seems to be contradictory. Um, the current policy and rule uh, speak to all schools having these resources and for all students and ensuring that um, these resources are in place for all students. When we talk about um, realigning those for some students and not others, that makes me nervous. So for those reasons, until we have discussed that and have had our questions answered, um, I would prefer Thank to you, hold Hinn. off and, and wait. Thank you. Ms. Joes, did you have a follow-up comment? Ms. Joes? 
Okay, so we are going to vote on the motion to wait for two weeks, correct? That's yeah. correct. Uh, yes, okay, roll call vote, Ms. Gover. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? I'm sorry, but yes. <laughs> Ms. Hen? Uh, yes. Ms. Jose? Ms. Jose? Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Time's up. Ms. Jose? Yes. Um, you know, I want to have a follow comment. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we're voting on the Ms. motion Jones. at this time. Okay, so we. Ms. Ms. Gover? Ms. Hassan? No. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. So the motion passes yes. to. No. Okay, Ms. Joes voted no. The no. motion passes to add the resolution to the February 28th board meeting. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the added work session on the superintendent's proposed FY 2024 operating budget. And for that, I call on Dr. Yarbrough and Mr. Hartlove. Good evening, Chairwoman Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the Board of, the Edu of Education. I'm pleased to open the fiscal year 2024 operating budget second work session this evening. The proposed budget is closely aligned to the BCPS strategic plan, the compass, our pathway to excellence, and the blueprint for Maryland's future. At this time, I turn it over to Mr. Chris Hartlove, Chief Financial Officer, and call forward Mr. Whit Tantleaf, Director of Budget and Reporting, to provide a brief update and answer questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey. Um, we have a brief presentation with some updated information. We're gonna, oh, thank you, it's loaded there. Uh, next slide, please. So between uh, the last time we met and um, today, there's been uh, some, some additional news uh, regarding revenue um, from the state, and we wanted to apprise you of that um, before we go any further in the, in the, in the process. So the first, the first uh, thing, item is, and these are both uh, related to state uh, state aid. The first item is, is, is good news. Uh, we have, uh, we, when we received our, our uh, preliminary numbers from MSDE, we were um, pleasantly surprised that there was an additional um, 48.8 million in uh, for compensatory education. Um, the increase, um, the, uh, we had an unprecedented increase in students eligible for comp ed funding, which is based on our free and reduced uh, enrollment count. The increase 29.1% uh, uh, in our free and reduced enrollment is primarily due to the introduction of the USDA direct certification Medicaid pilot. Uh, Maryland is one of seven states states newly approved by USDA to participate in the Medicaid matching pilot, which expands the Maryland direct certification system to include electronic matching with Medicaid data. That's background information. The bottom line is, is we have $48.8 million of additional revenue, which is the, the good news. Got, we, we received that information, we were very, very happy, and uh, um, then we, then the other kind of shoe fell or dropped, I don't know what the saying is, but uh, we heard that uh, our state aid may be reduced by 21.8 million. And this is uh, due to a, uh, net, a change in net taxable income. The state formula for revenue is wealth adjusted. So they, they, the formula works such that the wealthier jurisdictions get less uh, per student and the poorer jurisdictions get more per student. So it's so that's what they call wealth adjusted. The original calculation had a lower uh, net taxable income figure for Baltimore County included in it. Um, it wasn't our, that's not anything to do with our budget office. It's, it's, it's calculated uh, uh, by the state. 
there was a there was an error, and when they found the error, they found that our net taxable income was higher, which meant that we're wealthier, which means we uh, are the form that impacts the formula negatively, and we would lose. Right now, it's an estimate um, twenty one point eight million dollars. So that's so it nets out to twenty seven additional. So that's that's good news. So, but that's the update on revenue. And um, if, uh, next slide, please. So just talk about what this means uh, in numbers. Um, so, so uh, as I said before, 48.8 in compensatory education funding, uh, and then a $21.8 million reduction that nets to the $27 million of new revenue. Um, we uh, also have have uh, uh, heard from the county executive that our initial. Uh, um, request was higher than what uh, was going to be funded. Uh, we have, have gone forward with a, with a revised uh, a request of $23 million. Um, so we're using ha approximately half of that $27 million to reduce the request to the county from uh, $36.4 million down to $23 million. And then we would use the uh, remaining $16 million uh, Six, uh, I'm sorry, 13.6 million, um, and we would put that towards compensation increases, which would allow us to start to address um, uh, COLA and uh, for, for for our employees. And uh, as we said in the, as superintendent had in his budget, we also talked about further efficiencies to to uh, fund a COLA in the budget. So um, that is the update on revenue. I don't know if I missed anything there um, or any any questions on that. I guess at this point. Ms. Pumphrey. Um, when you spoke about the potential reduction, how do you come up with the, how did you come up with that estimated number and when can we expect to have an exact good. amount or close to exact amount? Very good question. We've been asking that same question of MSDE. They haven't given us a specific answer yet. The 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 um, estimate came from DBM, Department of Budget and Management, um, and um, we we haven't seen anything official yet, but what that is the that's the estimate from DBM of of what the uh, impact uh, uh, could be. I, I also uh, the the county is aware of this, and uh, the county is also trying to uh, see if there's any uh, could get any traction for a hold harmless, you know, for, for the twenty one point eight million dollar reduction. So there are things going on there. It's not a done deal yet. But we feel as though when you're talking about projecting and putting a budget together, you need to put together a realistic budget. We think that this is probably a higher chance of this happening than not. So we thought that it would be certainly something you need to be aware of. And probably we believe it, it's going to happen. Um, it would be great news if we find out later that it doesn't happen. But I think we should plan like we would plan in our households. We would probably say we, we need to plan on that. Thank you. Mr. Mueller, you have a question about the chart, about the slide? Mr. Hartloff, if you total the 48.8 and the 21.8, I come up with 70 million point six. I'm sorry, those, that should be a negative. It's a, the brackets, they mean negative. Okay, but I, yeah. So it but, should be a subtraction. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, no, 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 no. That's not on you. <laughs> Can the, the slide way be that brought I looked back at up? It, I'm taking the 48 million. Right, right. And then I'm taking the 20. 21.8. Right. And I just added them together for my sake. Right. That's $70.6 million that, that like, came about after we submitted our budget. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes. Yep. And I'm an average guy, but I don't understand that. Uh, yeah. Whose responsibility is that? Uh, it, did, yeah. did we drop the ball? Did the state was the state untimely in the way they did this? I don't I don't get this seventy million dollars at this point in time after he's presented. Yes, your mic. It's a it's a very very good question. I've been in this business for a while, as has Mr. Tantliff, and this is very unusual. I would would you? <laughs> we don't usually get these kind of changes. Um, I would say to 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 answer your question, it is a large amount of changes at the last minute. Um, the, when you're in the, the, the situation that we're in with a m major change to the formula um, and the change that, that, they, uh, that came about for the, the way uh, free and reduced students are, are, are uh, measured, um, it was something that statewide everyone is kind of, of, of dealing with. 
in that case, it's a good thing because we're getting more money. So, so um, it's because of a, a, a change in the formula that had an unanticipated uh, impact. The, the, the magnitude of the impact was not anticipated by the state or by us. We, no one in the state really anticipated this magnitude, but that was good news where we were to get more, more dollars. The, I think the error on the net taxable income, that is unfortunate because, you know, that's something that happened from the state's perspective and they calculated a formula with a, with a, a lower net taxable income than they should have. And it's, it's, you know, I always feel about errors. If you're going to err and get more money, I'm okay. If I'm okay if they say, "Oh, we made a mistake. You're getting more money." I don't necessarily like saying, "Oh, we made a mistake and it's less money." And but this is unprecedented um, change in formula, uh, then change in the way uh, 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 enrollment is measured, uh, uh, the free and reduced enrollment uh, is measured. Um, you know, I think it's a lot of change happened quickly, and um, there were there were unanticipated uh, changes that that came out of that out of those out of those changes to the formula. But I I definitely hear what you're saying, um, and I I don't like to bring you know changes like this other than positive ones to you. Did you have other slides for the presentation, or are you ready for just questions? That, that's really it at this point. I mean, we can just summarize where we've where we've been, and that's you know we we introduced the superintendent's uh, proposed operating budget, which is out on the web for anyone. That's 374 page uh, uh, budget. We have we've had three series of questions and answers, and all those answers are out on our web. I think it's 131 pages for anyone out in the audience that's that's interested can go out there. Very good questions. I think uh, the budget office and all the staff kind of came together to answer the questions, get you good information so you could make uh, good decisions. And I think at this point, any further questions you would have, and also then things that you're thinking about potentially wanting to add or subtract from the budget, if we get those items, then we can start to cost them out. So when we, when we actually, when you approve your actual budget, we can give you a real actual cost for what the items would, would be. Okay, so as far as questions, I'd like to go around the dais and just one by one instead of doing the hands up and chat up and, and all those pieces. So you can ask one question and if you'll follow up about that question and then if we need to go around again. So I'm gonna start with Ms. Nomanowski. Do you have any questions or a first question? Yes, uh, <laughs> first, thank you. I know I had a lot of detailed questions, um, but I, I, I wanted on purpose as far as um, taking out the professional and support stuff, I was trying to see where the salaries were. And um, this is just me doing Excel sheets on my um, Excel sheets. And what I was trying to figure out is, um, what I, well, what I noticed, I should say, is that um, on salaries were, um, that were bumped up, we either already were making um, 100,000 or were bumped up to 100,000, they got an increase of almost 2% and on average. And then on salaries that were under 100,000, on average, they received next. They didn't receive any kind of, um, on average, they didn't receive any kind of increase in their salary. It was actually negative 0 0.6. So, and we also added about almost nine um, salaries that were over 100,000, while we took away uh, 13 that were under 100,000. Is is there more that we can do there? I feel like we're um, giving more money to people that are already in that top level of salary wise and not compensating those that um, are on the lower scale. And, uh, uh, Mr. Cantlip, yeah, uh, Ms. Dominowski, what I'd say is in the budget book, the only compensation changes are steps. So uh, what you'd see is that's dependent on bargaining units and the most senior employees don't uh, have any steps. So executive directors, chiefs, you wouldn't see any increase at all. So um, the h largest increases uh, would be in AFSME and ESPBC because they have large gaps between their steps, whereas TABCO is about 1.8% on average, um, and some of the non-represented are 2%. But uh, what you'd need to do is look at each uh, line item. We'd need to look and see what's causing the change. Um, you know, it could be a different position. It could be more positions, but there's absolutely no COLAs on any employees, and the only increase is steps based on their bargaining unit. But these aren't, teach like, I, I mean, I'm going by how you separated um, the appendixes and then the departments. So I'm assuming um, 
you know, under schools, the school-based and the watershed, those are teachers that are in the classroom, correct? In that appendix, this, the, the appendix. sorry, Appendix A is all mm -hmm. teachers that would be under that COLA, I mean, under TABCO or other. Um, I, I, I don't have it right in front of me, but again, the only increases in the budget book are steps according to the bargaining units. So if you uh, had a page that you had a question on, we could look at it and tell you what's in there. There's non-salary items in there. Uh, you know, we broke out the uh, professional and non-professional for you, but there are no individuals getting anything more than a step in the budget book. Well, I mean, I took it exactly as you, when you broke it down and you took out the stipends, you took out, all, I, it was just the salary and the wages per uh, appendix, per department, and I, you know, took you know, how many professional staffs you had there. I just did total averages, and um, I mean, some of them went up by 24 percent, even or 26 percent, and that's just and by average. Again, the the only it, it could be a different uh, position is in. Again, I I can't say without looking at that page, and I you know send us any questions. We'd be glad to look at it. But I'm just saying, any individuals in the budget book. The only compensation change that anyone got was a step increase if they were entitled to it. If they're on the top step, then they wouldn't have gotten an increase. If they're senior, they wouldn't have gotten an increase. Um, but it's just according to where they sit on the salary scale. Unless there was a different position, there could be positions being added. Uh, and usually in the budget book, it'll tell you if there's a redirect or if there's an additional position or if there is a different position, a position could move from one office to another office, and you know we try we we detail those in excruciating um, detail. But if you sent us uh, questions, I could you know we research it and give you a, an exact answer on those pages. But I, I just want to emphasize the only change that any employee received in the superintendent's proposed budget is a step increase if they were entitled to it. Ms. Ms. Domenowski, were you were you comparing uh, the prior year budget to we okay and and I think you know just to kind of summarize what Mr. Uh, Tantliff is saying is it's not necessarily always the same makeup of, of employees so you know some of that could be some of that difference could be uh, it could be the mix of employees it could be um, um, it could be turnover in employees where we had. Um, someone uh, left and then we hired somebody, the person we hired, it was at a higher salary. Um, um, but, uh, so there's all kinds of reasons why that you could get those kind of, 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 of uh, math. I understand exactly what you did and I, I do those same types of things. But um, um, yeah, as far as what we put in there was just a step for everybody. So that part is, there's nobody, at this point, there's nobody getting any more than a step in the budget. So does everyone that's included in this budget get a step? Like every person here get a step? Everybody, a, no. every step, like every special education, third party, no, general no. Fund, everyone every who's, magnet office, every e-learning person, every, or is it just? Um, it's based on their bargaining unit and where they sit on the salary scale. Okay, so I'm if not, they're not. But what I'm saying is I'm including everyone. I'm not just including bargaining scale. And when we're in a situation where we're trying to retain teachers and, and get teachers in, we need to find out a way to move some money around where someone at the top end of their pay scale that is not necessarily a teacher, it's going to that water, right. like that school teacher fund. That's, that's right. what I'm saying. Can we look into that? Right. Thank you. Ms. Pumphrey? Can I pass for now, please? Sure. <laughs> Mr. McMillian? <laughs> <laughs> Did you pass? She yes, passed. Sorry. I okay. I hope to get a presentation on the agenda next meeting on athletic trainers. Can you guys work up a figure what it would cost for the 24 high schools to have individual trainers at each school? Uh, trainers. I think uh, Mr. Sai did that, so uh, we can so, dust off the old analysis okay, good. on that. So, yeah, so to get you involved in that piece. Sure. Thank you. <coughs> Ms. Hen, do you have a question? Thank you, I do. Um, and mine is more of a request along the same lines as Ms. Domanowski's question. Um, thank you for providing us with the report of general fund salaries and wages. That's extremely helpful. 
Um, I too would like to see greater detail on that report if possible in terms of the deltas um, between the current actual um, budget and the proposed in terms of positions um, that are vacant that are being eliminated or proposed to be eliminated um, versus which are being added, the counts of those positions um, or titles rather for those positions and some indication of whether it's an add or a removal if it's being removed because it's vacant or some indication of what's happening. Um, I think this format is fantastic, but if it would be possible to get that information and, and I know those details are in the budget book, but it's really helpful and clear the way you've got it outlined here. Um, is that something the board could receive? Uh, could you, could you please to? provide that request in writing so we could see exactly what you're asking? I'm sure we can deliver whatever you'd like as long as the information Absolutely. exists. Absolutely, and and I'm referring to um, in the question set, it, I believe it was in response to Ms. Dominowski's question, the um, Excel sheet, the report of general fund salaries and wages. I, I, I guess I'll, I'll just uh, add it. So there's a tremendous amount of data in that report, um, and so we'll have to just see exactly what uh, you're asking to make sure that we can pull it together. It could be a manual exercise. We'll do whatever we uh, possibly can. Okay, because I think a lot of the, the requests you may receive from the board are to cost out um, positions. We, we've prioritized in the past um, positions and salaries, and, and that's the data we really need at that granular of a level to understand all of the deltas and, and as Ms. Dominowski said, where those changes are being made. So it would be really helpful to see those deltas in one place to understand that. And if we do propose um, any amendments, it's it's just helpful because there are a lot of moving parts. It's a big budget and, and that would be helpful. So I'll I'll submit my, my request in writing. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Joes, do you have a question? Um, Okay, Ms. Harvey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think, uh, thank you for answering all of my questions previously, and uh, I appreciate the detail you provided. I, I think I want to reiterate that you know, we often say that this system is about people, and we are all concerned about our ability to provide a quality and equitable education to our students, and that begins with teachers and is certainly encircled with all of the other staff that support that process. And I would strongly urge that we look at the budget and we trim in areas from the outer circles in so that we can use as much of our resources as we possibly can to support having competitive salaries for our teachers and staff so that we can recruit and retain uh, teachers for our students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hassan. As of right now, I think I'm gonna. I'm, I think I'm gonna take a pass. Um, I think a lot of board members are asking some of the questions that I had, and I do want to take a minute to absorb the information that you guys have provided. Um, so thank you. I will get back to you with any questions that I have. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Dr. Savoy? No questions at this time. It was very self-explanatory, really. So I don't have any questions, nothing to add to that. Okay, thank you. Dr. Hager? Um, I also don't have any questions. I'm eager to see how the next few weeks go with respect to um, the different negotiations with our bargaining units and um, and I just want to acknowledge all of the new board members and those who have been around for a while who've been working so hard and going through the budget and asking so many great questions and I'm hearing that uh, folks are making their own spreadsheets. I just think it, it shows that our school system is in really good hands and I just really appreciate all of everyone's hard work with the budget. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Hager. Oh, yes, Ms. Joes, do you have a question? Dr. Kuhn, I mean, Mr. Kuhn, do you have a question? 
I do have a, a question. Um, mm -hmm. Mr. Hartliff and um, Mr. Tantliff, could you again just quickly explain the percentage of dollars that go to pay for people in our operating budget? Uh, roughly 85% salaries and benefits. Okay, so that's that's the bulk and any kind of increase in that has a massive outsized impact on, on any kind of changes um, to the budget, right? So if we're looking at a cost of living adjustment <clears throat> and 85% of our budget is on on people the magnitude of that change is is very significant right yeah no yeah there's no doubt that you know when you're in a service organization like a school system uh, salaries become you know the biggest the largest cost that you have whether it's adding people is expensive and taking care of your people by giving them increases is expensive and it typically um, is much larger than what the non-salary uh, costs are. So with that being the case and uh, the inflation the inflationary environment we've been you know we've been up against for the past two plus years, it, it, we are always chasing and unable to meet those numbers if they are gaining at significant times without, Spending 100% of budget of our budget on people is that is that accurate? Yeah, if you're looking to try to to address the salary by reducing the non-salary, you, you do run out of uh, you you run out of options eventually. You, you you there's certain things that are built in. We have to pay for our utilities. We have to pay for um, uh, you know all the other things that 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 you know our supplies and materials. Um, and so on. There's, you know, many things that that we have to have. So you can only go so far with those reductions. Um, and actually, uh, Mr. Tantliff and I were talking about that this morning. And a lot of these things are leverage for people doing their jobs. You know, if you don't have computers that work, if you don't have, um, you know, up to date curriculum or whatever those are those are things that impact your ability to do to do jobs. So you can you should be looking at those things. As much as you can, but um, y there is a limit to how far you can go with the non-salary items. Thanks, and and just uh, real quick, the um, some of the ESSER funds uh, that we received uh, during the COVID pandemic, um, when they run out, there are some fiscal cliffs that everybody's aware of, including the 15 minutes. Um, uh, for the extension of the school day that has been funded with those specific funds at this point in time. Uh, and we know that this is, in essence, one-time money um, and is not going to be continued by the federal government. So let me ask a question. Can you, can you please let us know how big that fiscal cliff that, that is right in front of us is in what year those funds run out? The, the challenge to the cliff comes next year. That's when the, so in the current year, we're good. Uh, the, the upcoming year, we're good for FY24. FY25 is when the ESSER dollars have to be utilized by. So uh, when, we're, when we're going into FY20, the FY25 budget is when those, the things that we're doing that are ongoing in nature and we want to continue those those items, we'll have to pick those up and absorb those in the general operating fund. Um, and a specific number, um, I can't give you, a, I, can, I can give you, I guess we could probably estimate where we are. Mid 30, yeah. mid 30, depending mid, on what we decide to yeah, go on with. We, yeah, we would start, let's say we'd start at, at, at $40 million, and what we'll have to do is, I, this, this will start this summer, we will take a, we will, put that list together and internally we'll start to look at those items and uh, discuss which items we want to um, 
bring forward to the next year and which items we want to sunset. So some of that will be that will be in next year's budget proposals to sunset certain things um, and other proposals to absorb things into the operating budget. But it's definitely will be uh, it will be a challenge uh, that we're going to have next year. OK, so just so I'm clear, we're facing a 30 to 40 million dollar shortfall in, in our budget year 2025. Mr. Kuhn, unfortunately, you're out of time right now. Okay. But you can well, submit I, that question. Yeah, you know, thank you for, uh, for the information. I appreciate it. Um, I just have a clarifying question. So um, I know it's in here. I just keep losing where it is. So the ESSER funds, we have one more year of the ESSER funds, right? Yes. So what in the budget book is pointing to how we're using those ESSER funds for year three, for next year? Um, if you look in special revenue, okay. ESSER and CARES have their own dedicated page. Okay. It's and under special. I'm sorry. Special revenue. Special revenue. So yeah. it's a grant. So it okay. has uh, a page. It's not, it doesn't detail every single piece of it, but it generally describes uh, what's going on. So is the current VLP program f funded with ESSER funds this year? Yes. But that's not included for use of ESSER funds for the upcoming school year? I think that's being looked at. Yeah, I think so. That's not in here right now. Um, I'm trying to remember. If well, the we LP was initially two years in the grant. Okay, there so you go. It, there's the answer. FY23 was the second year okay. of the LP. So the third, so the use of ESSER funds next year is being distributed other ways besides for the, the VLP program. As we sit right now, uh, we right, have right had now, discussions. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, I just thanks for that clarification. Okay, one more time to see if anybody has any second question, Ms. Dominowski. I'm, I'm okay. You're okay. Thank you. Back to you, Ms. Pumphrey. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hartlove. I just just a comment. Um, you mentioned that it's expensive to take care of our people, meaning um, essentially increasing salaries. Um, that's expensive. In my opinion, we can't afford not to take care of our people. We're in a crisis mode right now as far as academic, academic achievement for our students. And so I'll just reiterate with me, what Member Harvey said, her comment indicating that we need to find ways to make cuts from the outside in and do whatever it takes to recruit and retain, retain high quality teachers. Appreciate thank that. you. Mr. McMillian? No, thank you. Okay. Ms. Harvey? Um, I'm sorry. Ms. Hen, do you have a last, another question? Just one quick one. Thank you. Um, have we begun the process of tiering our requests. I know that's something that the county executive um, has mentioned at times that he requests of all of um, the county agencies to submit their requests as tiered requests. Is is that an activity or an, an exercise that we've asked department heads to do when um, submitting tiers that the board could receive any information? If we're looking from, and I agree with um, Vice Chair Harvey and what Member Pumphrey just said. I, we, uh, we have talked about tiering um, salaries to kind of see at, at various levels of revenue what type of salary increase we could, uh, we could uh, fund in the budget. But as far as the actual items in the budget, um, we don't have a prioritized list of, of that. At, um, um, but certainly that's something that uh, if there's input from the board, we can... We did that last year. That was one of the things. Uh, we, it was a general kind of prioritization of people and um, and salaries. But we, certainly, any type of prioritization is helpful because super, uh, the uh, CE ultimately can take that when he when he's making his decisions and uh, and inform inform him as 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 what our priorities are. Right, and and certainly we'd rather make those decisions right. internally. So, yep. okay, and, and we'd rather make in, intelligent, informed decisions with inputs from each department head. Um, so, okay, that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Ms. Joes? Ms. Harvey? I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Ms. Hassan? I will pass. Thank you. Um, Mr. Offerman? Dr. Savoy, Dr. Hager, no, 
Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and my my last one is is a comment. I'm, I agree with um, what Ms. Pumphrey and Ms. Harvey said, but I, my concern is building the capacity of the teachers that we're recruiting and retaining, and I have trouble finding in the budget book where we're putting resources forward for that professional development. Um, so I you know whether it's resource teachers or, but we need to make sure that we not only get the teachers, but we help them increase their capacity. And I'm not seeing that um, directly in the budget book. And I also like to thank you for answering all hundred and <laughs> <laughs> all of our hundreds of questions. But go ahead, Mr. I, the only thing I, I was going to say is that so what we'll do at this point is is we we have a, a question that um, um, Ms. Hen is going to get us in writing. Mm -hmm. We'll treat that like the other questions that we've received, and we'll 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 do our best to to try to get that turnaround quick. Uh, we have a, 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 a one item on our on our list to price out which we will do that and we will bring those things back at the next at the next meeting uh for for a, a, a vote okay all right well thank you very much thank you thank you okay okay so i did not refresh but i think a second Okay. Um, okay. So next on the agenda is the vir the next item on the agenda was added this evening. It's the virtual learning program, and for that, I call on Dr. Yarbrough. Thank you. Call on Dr. Boswell Mokomis, Dr. Elmendorf, and Ms. Forbes to come forward. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to share with you the history, progress, current status, and proposed future of the BCPS Virtual Learning Program, or VLP. Baltimore County Public Schools has a long history of providing virtual learning opportunities to students in secondary schools through e-learning. All LEAs in the state of Maryland were directed to provide a system-wide virtual learning program to meet the needs of families in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Since 2021, we have kept the Board of Education and the BCPS community regularly updated about the virtual learning program through quarterly system-wide presentations about student enrollment, attendance, and performance. To date, all information items and quarterly presentations regarding VLP have been made to ensure that all parties were apprised of the scope of services and student progress, including the elimination of kindergarten last year. The purpose of today's presentation is to provide critical context regarding the future of VLP and to outline next steps to move forward in service of students and families. As was stated several times this evening, the virtual learning program was funded in 2021 with one-time ESSA grant funds. The original plans funded both FY22 and FY23. This was affirmed in the MSDE amendment to ESSER funds application that was submitted during the 21-22 school year. Although the program was scheduled to sunset in FY24, options to sustain safe and supportive environments, student support for those with physical and mental health needs, administrative placements, staffing shortages, and family preferences pointed towards the need to continue VLP for FY24. Members of Cabinet reviewed student data, system needs, and possible grant options to extend the VLP for at least an additional year. We also co collaborated with union partners to discuss a process for FY24 that would include early communication for all impacted staff by the continuation of or adjustments to VLP. Decisions for next steps included an analysis of all local education agency virtual offerings for students, which revealed the following. 21 virtual programs operated this school year, including BCPS. Of the 20 other programs that operated, excluding BCPS, the programs varied in size from 14 students enrolled to 2,659 students. 
15 of the programs have an enrollment of fewer than 500 students, and five programs have an enrollment of greater than 500 students. Eight school systems to date have confirmed that they will continue with a virtual program in school year 23-24. On the slide is depicted the largest school systems in Maryland, what their enrollment are, as well as the enrollment in virtual programs. The cost of our current VLP program is $16,543,621. The proposed cost for FY24 would be $6.6 million. Staff had analyzed ESSER funding, identified adjustments in different areas, and would be able to submit an amendment to the grant application to cover the cost of the proposed VLP using the final year of ESSER funds. The federal grant used to fund the VLP will be in its final year this upcoming year. As such, it is proposed that the VLP will be reduced in size and serve students in grades four through 12. This recommendation aligns with other programs in the state and an analysis of the most pressing needs being successfully met for students in the current VLP. This reduction in size would allow for ESSER funds to be used this upcoming year and provide an opportunity to transition to the operating budget or another source of funding for FY25 and beyond. We acknowledge VLP is a program that many families have found to be useful. We are committed to continuing it in, in some form. However, Maintain the current level of VLP in light of the projected elimination of ESSER grant, grant funds, the uncertain fiscal landscape, and competing priorities of funding compensation to recruit and retain a high-quality workforce, it is necessary for us to prioritize the greatest area of need for VLP across schools and pursue reductions. At this time, I turn it over to Chief Academic Officer Dr. McComas, Dr. Elmendorf, and Ms. Forbes. So thank you, good evening, and happy Valentine's Day. I'm joined this evening, Dr. Elmendorf oversees VLP, and Ms. Forbes is the director of the program. Um, at this time, I will have Dr. Elmendorf pick up uh, at the presentation, and then we'll be happy to answer questions at the end. All right, thank you, Dr. McComas. In the spring of 2021, BCPS decided to utilize federal grant funds, ESSER 3 as we discussed tonight, to create and implement a full-time K-12 virtual learning program, which we like to call the VLP. And that was for the 21-22 school year. The VLP was originally intended as a one-year program designed as a final support for students in response to the COVID-19 global pandemic. As directed by the Maryland State Department of Education, the intent was to provide a supplemental virtual program for students until vaccinations were available and accessible to all students and caregivers were confident in returning their children to in-person learning. The program allowed for students to be co-enrolled with a VLP and their primary school of attendance in order to allow for participation in sports and extracurricular activities, among other school-based services. The plan, along with the process for co-enrolling uh, students in VLP, was communicated to families in the spring of 2021. During 2021, more than 3,700 students were co-enrolled with the VLP. Next slide, please. The program now, in its second year of operation, has demonstrated significant academic growth. Woohoo! <laughs> as shared in Board of Education presentations and has evolved to meet the unique needs of students who require or would benefit from a learning environment different from that of the brick and mortar schools to which they are traditionally assigned. Ongoing professional development specific to online teaching and learning along with the addition of support staff including a PPW, a social worker, school psychologist, school psychologist and department chairs have all contributed to the impressive progress made from year one. This year, the VLP is fully staffed and serves 1,113 full-time students in grades one through 12. The middle and high school programs also serve 517 part-time students who are accessing high quality virtual instruction as a solution to persistent teacher vacancies at several schools. The total enrollment for the 22-23 school year is currently 1,630. I would love to introduce the director of the virtual learning program who is going to share with you some uh, VLP demographics. Great, thank you and good evening. 
This slide depicts the demographics of students enrolled in the VLP from grades one through 12, part-time and full-time for all reasons, including addressing staffing shortages in secondary schools in math, science, and world language courses. 59.4% of students in the VLP are black, African-American, 20% white, 6.3% Asian, 5.1% two or more races, ethnicities, and 5.1% Hispanic Latino. As of September 30th, 2022, 3.6% of the students in the VLP are English learners, 60.3% qualify for free and reduced meals, 11.7% are students with disabilities who qualify for an IEP, and 6.8% of students qualify for a 504 plan. Next slide, please, and I will hand it back to Dr. Elmendorf. Thank you. So the program, um, as we are proposing it, would, will continue to be utilized to provide staffing relief to schools and to accommodate student placement decisions. Students who are currently enrolled in VLP will have the opportunity to be considered for a seat in the 23-24 school year by applying for a lottery seat, which I will describe in a moment. For students who transition back to their schools of primary enrollment, we would ensure that they are supported in this process by having VLP staff um, work to our, help with articulation information at the st with the staff at each child's primary school of enrollment to schedule their classes and related services. So as far as the breakdown is for what we're proposing as far as enrollment goes um, for the 23-24 school year, so elementary grades four and five, we would, um, each level would have 40% lottery seats, so 18 lottery seats for elementary grades four and five with 26 um, seats for placement, equaling four, um, 44 total seats in grades four and five. For middle school, 40% of 244 seats would be 98 lottery seats and 146 seats open for uh, placements. And at the high school level, 40% of 407, which is 163 lottery seats and 244 placement seats for a total of 279 lottery seats and 416 placement seats for a total VLP enrollment of 695. Just want to note that the, the placements that we're talking about would also include um, the possibility of uh, approved special permission transfers for medical exceptions if those come about. This time we'll take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I know that was um, short notice for putting that together for us, but it's appreciated. Um, Mr. McMillian? I'm just curious, do you have a slide of that last portion that you talked about with the lottery seats for the fourth and fifth and that do you have that slide because I is it on the slide or no? it's not on the slide uh, Mr. McMillian okay thank you it's so it's essentially though uh, Mr. McMillian 40 percent of each at each level are lottery seats other questions yes yes Miss Joes I have a oh Miss uh, Dr. Savoy I'm sorry Okay. Um, yes. Uh, can the program adequately meet the needs of the IEP student, and how are these students supported? Is that Ms. You, um, Ms. Forbes, would you like to address that? Sure. Thank you. Yes, we are staffed with special educators and IEP chairs. Um, every time a student is placed in the VLP, the IEP team meets, looks at that student's individual needs, um, and determines that their FAPE can be met in the VLP. And then we connect students with other resources that we have in the program based on the unique needs of, those, of that student. And again, just to reference um, the previous slide, um, at, as of the September 30th enrollment, 11.7% of students in the VLP do have an IEP and receive support aligned to that IEP. Okay. Thank you very much. Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so do we know how many students by grade will be affected? Um, in other words, will not have the opportunity to have a lottery seat, um, assuming they, they won't receive special placement. How many will this affect? And I heard you say there's no slide on this, but can you read us those numbers? For the current enrollment. Mm -hmm. okay. Just Dr. McCombs. Just a moment, Ms. Hen, we're looking at our calculations, make sure we're Dr. Yeah. Yeah. answer accurately for you. So currently, for example, in grades four, we have 85 students and um, 
Uh, actually, I'm going to let Ms. Forbes answer this because this, this is her data. Only <laughs> okay, so um, if we were looking, m moving forward with the current students who are enrolled, so we would base our enrollment upon the prior year from this year moving ahead. So, for example, your third graders <clears throat> moved to fourth grade. So, assuming every student wanted to retain that seat, currently um, we have 47 students enrolled right now in first grade who would be moving to second, uh, 50 moving to third. 79 moving to fourth grade, 85 moving to fifth grade, and shall I continue into the secondary grade levels? Okay, so 85 in sixth grade, 86 in grade seven, 142 in grade eight, <clears throat> and then moving to the high school grade levels, 135 in grade nine, 84 in grade 10, 111 in grade 11 and 107 for grade 12. So for a total of the existing full-time enrollment, which is 1,011 students as of current. So I think, Ms. Hen, your question was how many students then would have to possibly return to their school of co-enrollment? And so we said it was approximately 40% at each grade level. Did I? 40% would need to return or we're reserving seats for 40%? If I may. Yes. So what I would um, ask that we have the ability to do is to analyze the numbers because it's not an apples to apples comparison. Some of the students that Ms. Forbes just identified could very well be there for a placement or they could be there for a medical exception. In those cases, they would not be taking a lottery seat. So if given the uh, time to do that, we can give you clear numbers in terms of the potential uh, impact of number of students, families competing for those lottery seats. That would be helpful. Thank you. Um, and my follow-up question is, could you briefly describe the costs and, and is it correct that we're looking at an additional 10 million over what is currently budgeted if we, if the board wanted to continue VLP next year at its current um, enrollment? Yeah, thank you, Ms. Han. So um, thank you. if you look at uh, the first slide, we're saying that the, the proposal that we're, we have here today would be the $6 million. Um, if we were to continue the VLP in its current format with the size that it is now, it would be the $16 million. And as far as what the, the funding goes toward, it's, it's almost all FTE with the exception of um, some money for supplies for students, which is less than $100,000. So it is FTE, so those FTE would not, we're shifting those costs because presumably they would be returning to brick and, brick and mortar. mortar, correct? Correct. Ms. Harvey, do you have a question? Uh, yes, just a clarification. For the students who have IEPs, is there admission into the VLP program based on your ability to serve or meet the conditions of their IEP? And does that mean that all of that is happening virtually for these students? That, that's a great question, Ms. Harvey. Thank you for that question. So um, the decision as to whether or not a student can or should be in the virtual learning program is exclusively with that VLP, or with that IEP team, rather. And so sometimes the IEP teams are held virtually, if, if that's what you're asking, whether it be out of the school, IEP team or to be the VLP IEP team, sometimes they're held virtually either way, but um, the, the team itself um, is exclusive to the decision-making body as far as whether, the, uh, whether FAPE can be met in the virtual learning program. And does that mean that all of their services or the conditions of their I IEP are met virtually? Oh, I see, yes. Yeah, so anybody who is in the virtual learning program, they all their services are met virtually, which is why we have special educators and, and such that can meet the needs of the, their IEPs on the, on the, for the students. Because the students are 100% virtual, so their needs are met virtually, yes. Um, I just want to follow up on that question. What did the part-time status mean? In one of the slides it said how many full-time, how many part-time. So what is part-time status? Yeah, so that's a great question. The part-time students are those who are 
um, in, our, in the VLP as a result of the staffing relief. So there might be a student in a high school, for example, who spends most of the day um, at the school, taking classes at school, but goes to VLP for math. So they might be in the library with um, an adult supervision and they're taking a, just a math class with the virtual learning program. Okay. Thanks. Dr. Hager? Um, yes, thank you. I have a few questions, and the first one I may have been answered. I, I was. I apologize. I, I wasn't following at one point. Um, the the per pupil cost of um, the VLP versus a brick and mortar building. Can you comment on that, Dr. Hager? We don't have that information. Uh, we could pull it for you. I think that would be very relevant to, to the conversation to understand. Kind of, is this a more expensive investment per student compared to the rest of the, the in-person schooling. Um, the second question is the VLP, and I know, I, know I, I think I've asked this before, is it's different than home and hospital. So children with um, an illness or an injury or, um, or who can't attend in-person school because of a disability, this is not the program that they would attend, correct? For the most part, that is correct. There are some exceptions. If a student um, is in home and hospital because of virtue of their, um, their needs, their medical needs, there are times when a student who is in home, home and hospital can access virtual learning program services as a result of being in home and hospital. It's very, very few students, less than 10, that are currently in that situation. Okay, so it's it is two, a resource. Actually, so. program-wide, we have two students who are in home and hospital and accessing VLP services. If I may, Dr. Okay. Hager, to your point, yeah. oftentimes students who are in, in home and hospital, uh, their medical condition is, is really what drives their ability to engage in academic um, learning. And so they may be undergoing some kind of treatment where their ability to engage in learning may be you know, very limited on a daily basis while they're in treatment. Um, but as they recover, they may be able to access. So that's why the home and hospital program is much more flexible and customized based on the student medical needs. Uh, but to Dr. Elmendorf's point, where um, VLP is able to support that, um, we try to optimize across the programs to make sure that we're providing the highest level of service. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, my next question is, I recall that um, if, if a student wasn't doing well academically in the VLP, then they were asked to uh, return to a brick and mortar school. Is, is that still the case? I just I wonder if the uptick in academic performance may be due to eliminating the students who weren't excelling in the VLP setting. That, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, I would ag agree, Dr. Hager, in that uh, at the end of last year, we sat and had um, involved conversations with families to discuss, is the VLP meeting the needs of their students, and are their students being successful in that program? And if they were not being successful, we recommended that parents return their student to the brick and mortar where in-person instruction and all the in-person resources could be available to those students. Uh, so you're right, we, we did not um, sustain students that it was not a good match for their learning. We know that this is a particular format of delivery for instruction that is not necessarily a match for every learner. Um, and so that was done in partnership with parents as we, we talked, had involved conversations around how best to serve their students and if they, their students were not being successful, then it, it was not in the student's best interest to keep them there. So certainly there is a correlation. Uh, we, we can say that the students this year, and you have seen the academic improvements, there's definitely a correlation that we're identifying a population that this model of instructional delivery is, is being successful for. And I'll, I'll turn, Dr. Elmendorf, if you have anything yeah, to add. That, that's absolutely right, Dr. McComas. And I would just add that um, the academic progress that we're sharing with you includes any student and all students who have also been administratively placed or replaced by a student conduct hearing officer into the virtual learning program. So it isn't just the students who succeeded last year academically. Okay, so, so you, there are students who um, are suspended or expelled from school who attend the VLP? Correct. That's good, okay. And then my last question is, um, you mentioned using ESSER funds next year. I, I, from what I recall, the Board of Ed did not necessarily um, you know, pass a motion on how the ESSER funds were used. So is this just information sharing or do we approve something and then if the funds are not used for the VLP, would it go back into the general budget that we were discussing earlier tonight? 
So I, uh, we have brought this forward for discussion to ensure that our, as board members, everyone understands where we are with the VLP and what we're proposing for next year. Um, it's important to understand that if um, these ESSER funds do, uh, they, they are grant funds, so they don't go into the operating budget. As such, they remain in the grant funds, which are special revenue. Um, that, again, the grant could be allocated in other ways because we originally did not intend uh, for the virtual learning program to extend into the third year of the grant. Uh, but as you recall, back in uh, spring of 21, uh, there was many unknowns about the virtual program as we were at the, in those early uh, stages of the pandemic still working towards vaccinations being available. Um, so just to, to uh, reiterate, these funds, if they weren't used for VLP, they remain in the ESSER grant funds, which as Mr. Hartlove explained, um, extend through next school year and the federal grant, um, the end date of the federal grant is September 30th of 2024. Uh, so again, it really just provides us one more academic year. That's all my questions. Thank you very much. Um, I have a, several questions. Um, I can't remember them. So the first one being, um, you said the students are co-enrolled. So are they included in staffing in the brick and mortar school? Yes, so um, right now we have the benefit, um, the two years of the program, all staffing were um, created and sustained through the ESSER grants. So over the last several years, uh, no staffing was taken from any school to stand up the VLP. And likewise, the staffing that we are proposing for next year are not part of school staffing. Um, so we have a thousand students that we have taken from brick and mortar school, a thousand plus students that we have taken from brick and mortar schools, but we have not taken any faculty, any staff, um, or any uh, budget from any school. The entire program has been funded uh, in full through the ESSER grant. So in essence, these students are counted in their brick and mortar school for staffing and counted in the VLP for staffing. Yes, because the right. uh, grant is supplemental, so it's right. the extra. Right, so if, mm -hmm. if there's, what'd you say, 1,100 kids currently in it, if we divided that by 25 students in a class, that's over 40 FTEs that are in double Okay. The other question is, were parents told at the beginning of the school year that this is the last year for the virtual learning program? That's a uh, great question. Thank you, Ms. Lichter. So we specifically did not share with parents what the, the plan was, I guess, because we didn't know what it was either necessarily. However, we have always shared with our families that um, the VLP is grant funded and is was designed to be temporary. In fact, we shared with them the language that was shared in the application to the Maryland State Department of Education, which I read some of tonight as far as what the purpose of the virtual learning program was originally. But it seems to have morphed into serving multiple purposes beyond the needs um, for, for the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So you're using it for administrative placements, medical placements, and staffing, which are all above and beyond the original intent when we were in COVID. Correct. That's accurate. Okay. Mr. McMillian? I just want to state that all along I've been a supporter of the VLP. And I taught school for 35 years. The traditional school building with the traditional classrooms and the movement in the hallways, it's, it's not geared for every kid. And there's some kids that find success in this VLE that don't find it in a classroom, in a traditional classroom. And I'm an advocate for to, to keep providing a service for these kids because some of them thrive. And I'm, t I'm talking to the choir. I know that. Oh, yeah. They thrive in that setting because they don't have to deal with the nonsense that goes on in the school buildings. And they, whether they're in their room or where they are in their home, and they're doing their learning on that computer screen, interacting that way. And they, some of, they love it. And you've got the numbers that, that show that. Mm -hmm. I think we've got to con look at some way to con continue this. Now, has it, has, it, has it branched off and taken in some other kids? Okay. But there's kids out there that need this program to succeed. And if we take it away from them, <laughs> and we put them back in, in a traditional classroom now that they've had this opportunity, I'm not betting they're going to succeed in the, you know, going back in a traditional setting. Thank you. 
Um, I agree with Mr. McMillian, and, and I'd like to make a motion to continue the virtual learning program as implemented during the current school year for grades 2 to 12, allowing no new students other than administrative and medical placements, understanding that the 23-24 school year will be the final year of the existing VLP program. Staff will work to form a comprehensive plan for proposing the use of virtual learning along with e-learning for the 24-25 school year. Second, Ms. Hen. Um, so I think the discussion is based on exactly what Mr. McMillian said. This is serving a purpose beyond what it was originally intended for during an emergency situation. I am concerned about the timing, especially for families. Um, that's why I asked the question, did they know previous? So we would be telling them pretty late as far as families that may want to look for alternative um, school situations for the upcoming year. They've missed that timeline, so I'm concerned. Um, we've heard from many parents and staff about the successes that their students are experiencing in virtual learning. Um, so I am very concerned about the abrupt ending of it right now, but it would be they would be informed that the existing program would not look the same for the 24-25. We have a robust and successful e-learning program. To me, this could be a form of that, um, and given time, staff could come up with a proposal that we can um, that we can then listen to. Yes, I will put it in. I have it ready to put in there. Um, any other discussion? Oh, I thought I did. Um, yes, Ms. Hager, Dr. Hager. I, I just wanted to clarify that your motion is uh, based on the proposal we just saw, so that it would be the funding would come from the ESSER grant as described in the presentation. Well, the proposal that was prescribed is reducing the program um, drastically. So you, that's what I was. I, I thought that's what I heard in your motion. So you're you're proposing to sustain it with funding that would come from where? Well, I was going to say the S, the using ESSER grant funds. That's why I'd asked previously during the work session if the funds would be available for a year three. Chair Lichter. Yes, Dr. Yarbrough. If I could uh, respond to that, the six million dollar uh, cost because the. Uh, virtual learning program was scheduled to sunset this year. Mm -hmm. um, staff were able to go back and take a look at all of the ESSER funding, what's been used, what's unused, and then came up with the $6 million. So there would be, I think it's $6.5 million available um, to fund the VLP of ESSER funds for this upcoming year. But there would be that discrepancy between the $6.5 million and the current operating cost of $16.5 million. So that's why I inquired where the other, the rest of the ESSER funds were being used for in the upcoming school year. Or is that it? There's only six million left in ESSER. It's not being used for. There's more than six million left in ESSER. The uh, detailed list of ESSER, it's available on our uh, website. It's a variety of things: compensatory services, 15 minutes um, a day for school. Um, you have some facilities. You know. Uh, there's a long list of things that, uh, including some FTEs uh, in schools, like IEP facilitators, as well as some classroom teachers and staff development teachers, are some that come to mind. But there's an extensive list that we can be provided. Other, I'm trying to write and conduct at the same time. Other comments? I think that I, I'm kind of just going along with what you were saying. Um, if this money that to keep funding it for the, another year is coming from grant funds fully, or are we going to have to find the money to back it up is my only concern. Yeah, so I'll just uh, comment, uh, Ms. Dominowski, that uh, essentially, as we said, we had only anticipated having the virtual program on the grant for year one and year two of the grant. So we had not originally planned to have the virtual program for the year three. Uh, as Dr. Yarborough has indicated, we had already planned to spend year three in other ways. Uh, the team was able to go back and carve out um, the positions that would equate to the six million uh, to create a reduced program. If we want to sustain the program at the current size, we do need to figure out, as Dr. Yarborough said, that um, $10 million difference. And uh, rather that difference is on a grant, which would mean there's other trade-offs. 
Um, and I'm not sure that we're prepared this evening to talk about what those other trade-offs may or may not be because uh, you'd have to weigh all of that into consideration or find the difference in the operating funds uh, to sustain it. So, so yes, it's, it's, a, it's <laughs> you know, many decisions to make, so. Um, Ms. Harvey? Uh, so I'm still not clear. Yes, ma'am. Is the six plus million covering the program as described with the 40% lottery or is it or is the 40 the program as described with the 40% lottery requiring uh, the the 16 million what do uh, we yeah so the reduced program which is where the lottery enters the conversation is re is only 6 million dollars to sustain the program as we have it today, um, the lottery only exists because we can't, if we reduce it, we cannot accommodate every student who's with us this year. So, so the lottery was, it was our most equitable way of putting in to try to stay into the, in the program. So the 16 million is kind of the Cadillac version and the 6 million is the, the smaller reduced size program. And your current proposal is to, for this one year, uh, implement the VLP with the 40% lottery. If we reduce the program in its size, then we don't have as much space for enrollment. Okay. And so the enrollment, uh, because we can accommodate a smaller enrollment, is where we're trying to provide um, fair and equitable access for the families that are currently in the program who may not want to uh, to leave the program, but because we would be reducing um, the, the size of the program. I hope I, I, hope that I was no, more that, clear that time. No, that helps. Time. I just okay. wanted to make sure that we were all understanding what the six plus million was paying for. Yes, yeah, so the six plus million is the smaller program. The 16 million is what we're currently offering. So forgive my metaphors, but I, I tend to speak in metaphors. Ms. Lichter, if I might, did you, in your proposal, or in your motion rather, did you say grades one through 12? I know I said two, so I was trying okay, to, so if, if no I, new placement, no new placements, except medical or administrative. Yes, thank you. And if I just may add um, a point of um, understanding as well for our board members, uh, MSDE's recommendation uh, coming out of the first year of virtual programs across the state was that they recommend programs, um, youngest learners be in grade three. And so we, we were rolling that grade up. So to your point, Ms. Lichter, you know, this year's first graders would become next year's second graders. Uh, they're recommending uh, third grade um, as kind of best practice for younger learners because we know it's such, uh, such a critical year uh, in those early grades around literacy and mathematics. So you're saying prefer three through 12 versus the two through 12? Well, what I would say is foresight. So um, what I hear among our board is there is an interest in sustaining some type of virtual option for the long run. Um, and that I would definitely say we want to honor, you know, in your proposal what you said around second grade, but I would offer that in years beyond next year that um, best practice would be to roll that cohort up to third grade and not to take students younger than third grade is what uh, the State Department of Education is recommending as programs continue to evolve. We know that uh, life on this side of the pandemic is not, you know, is going to be different. The landscape is different and I appreciate uh, our board and us working in partnership to figure out what's that landscape look like for our families. Right, and the motion that it would end next year as is, and then staff would have the chance to say what does virtual learning look like in, BC in BCPS? Yes. Any other discussion? Madam Chair? Yes, oh, I'm sorry, yes, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, so I had a question based on um, board member discussion around funding. Um, to sustain the existing VLP program through ESSER funds and to prioritize the use of um, ESSER funds to do so over any new initiatives or new use of the year three funds and whether or not um, we wanted to amend your motion to include that. 
and if we wanted to ask staff to bring us a proposal to do so. If there would be support around um, adding that to your motion. So say what the, mo the amended motion would be. Uh, let me um, put that in the chat. Are you adding or striking what I included in the chat? I was asking in general if there was interest in adding to what you put in chat to specify that we would continue the existing VLP program and fund it um, through ESSER, fu ESSER funding and ask staff to bring a proposal um, to the meeting on the 28th to specify how they would do, do so. Basically by postponing any other use of or coming up with an alternative um, plan to fund anything that had previously been planned for the use of those funds. Because as Dr. McComas said, those were planned for other uses. Can I speak to Okay, that? yes, Dr. Yarbrough. There were new uses of those. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Um, I would like to share that there are no new initiatives that are being planned for FY24 using ESSER 3 funds. Um, it's also important to note for the board, one of the large expenditures beyond the 15 minutes a day is our safety assistance that we've implemented across all secondary schools. We've added additional safety assistance and we've started the implementation of elementary school safety assistance. Um, and then I mentioned earlier other positions including IEP facilitators, um, staff development teachers, um, in some schools it's MTSS teachers in some middle schools. So when we're talking about moving the ESSER 3 funds. There are some funds for air purifiers and things like that, but when we're talking about removing those funds, we are largely talking about people that are already in place in schools that would be losing positions uh, for something that is you know, also identified as a goal to make sure that we have safe and supportive environments and that we're developing the capacity within our teachers so that we can retain them and recruit other teachers so they know they'll be supported as they come to our school system. So these are additions? These were funded this year through the ESSER funds also? This yes, year? the last two. Um, safety assistance started this year and they're on the grant for next year. Um, and some of the other positions started uh, the previous year. So, but is our ESSER funding for year three less than what it was for years one and two? No. So if we funded it, if we funded it all this year, why can we not fund it all next year unless there are new positions? So from the beginning of the grant, um, and I'll ask Mr. Hartlove if I say anything incorrect to correct me. So from the beginning of the grant, we proposed um, what the spending would be for each year. So if you go to that. Uh, document that's on the web and also in our amendment, we didn't only include what we needed year one. Year one, you'll see more of a reliance on those things that were directly related to the, can uh, to the pandemic, like masks, like uh, air purifiers, et cetera. Um, the extra 15 minutes is on all three years of the grant. You'll find the safety assistance after the students came back from the grant and we realized that they needed more um, support, that's when in the amendment we planned for uh, starting with the pilot last spring, uh, FY23 and FY24 to use the safety assistance. So from the very beginning, we allocated a three-year plan. Um, as needs arose that were directly related to the pandemic, we submitted amendments to the state that were approved, um, safety assistance being a large one. And so, you know, everything has been allocated compensatory services to look at the impact of uh, the pandemic on our special education students and their needs. And so that, that's why we're able to go look at actuals, actual expenditures versus what was projected um, to find out where we had space um, and how we could respond to the need as, um, as you've pointed out, as uh, you know, Mr. McMillian have pointed out, that we know that VLP certainly uh, meets the need of our students and family. So what's the funding source that's available and how many um, FTEs could we afford and leverage what we already had in e-learning to meet the needs of those students? Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Williams? I, oh, Madam Chair, may I finish my um, question or comment briefly? I don't need to make a motion to amend. 
your motion in that case, I would just ask, and I would still support this, I would ask that the board receive a detailed plan should this motion pass of um, staff's recommendation for funding. That's all. Thank you. Dr. Williams. Thank you. Good evening, board members. Uh, Dr. Yarbrough actually gave <coughs> the response that I was going to give. The ESSER funds, we develop a plan <coughs> and for us to go back and find $10 million to continue the as is of the virtual learning program. That means we will be looking at something uh, within the plan, such as safety assistance, compensatory services, um, just to name two items, and of, co of course, the big ticket item was the 15 extra minutes that we needed to do as a system to put us aligned with other systems in the state of Maryland. And so um, <clears throat> I'm a little concerned about the ask, the uh, this motion for us to go back. Um, it does mean that we would be eliminating uh, positions, um, particularly around what we've added in the amendment. But I believe Dr. Yarbrough gave a very detailed response on my behalf. Thank you, Dr. Yarbrough. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Yeah, just echoing what we just heard, I, I just cannot get behind $10 million out of our ESSER funds, um, given that I believe also they're used for tutoring services and some of the mental health services in schools. Um, and I, I know everything's a trade-off, but I, I just think that we, we cannot take $10 million of that to sustain the VLP. And I, I do appreciate the presentation the staff gave, providing a, a reasonable way to extend what, what already exists, and then we can revisit it next year. But But I think the $6 million proposal on the table makes sense. I think adding the other $10 million and taking it away from other services just doesn't make any sense to me. That's all. Okay. So can we have a roll call vote at this time? Let's We're voting with, on the, what? Um, I'd like to rewrite the motion, but I'm just gonna, right. I guess what my worry is, is we've gone from this big to this small. So is there a way, I'm just worried about that 40, it doesn't even feel like 40% based on the numbers that you gave us. So I guess knowing how many of those are medical placements and how many, um, because how many of those, the numbers that you gave us just don't add up to 40%. It sounds like way more students will be displaced out of the virtual learning program than 40, unless you have a vast majority of those kids that have medical and then would take up the medical spaces. So. I wish there was a compromise between so few kids remaining and then the, and then all remaining. Chair yes. Lichter. I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. I just want a clarification. The 40% is 40% of the voluntary students. Not it's not 40% of the total pool. It's 40% of those students who are electing to attend. Let me, let me share the process okay. we, we went through. I think it'll make it much more clear, and I'm sorry that it wasn't clear. So what we, what we did was we reduced the size of the VLP first, decided how many seats we would have in each grade level, and then took 40% of those seats and allocated those for lottery seats. So it's not 40% of anything that is current. It's 40% of the, the new, the, number. The new uh, structure, the new number. which okay. is a very much reduced size right. VLP. And so for middle school, you said that there are currently 98 students. Is that what the number was? This year, there's 98 middle schoolers. How many, how many middle school students do we have now? This is now. We have 363 300, middle school students okay, right now. 363. How many seats will be for middle school? I feel like we're doing a test. Yeah, so How many students <laughs> seats will there be for middle schoolers in your proposed? 244 <laughs> total. And that includes or does not include medical, extra staffing needs, and administrative? Includes. So includes, it would so be 98 percent or 98 students, uh, lottery seats, and 146 seats for placements. So 98 students from the current 300 and some Correct. students. So that's way less, Correct. that's not, okay, that, the 40% was throwing us. Is I'm sorry, if I might interrupt, that, that piece is not correct. So out of the 300 students that we have in middle school right now, some of them will meet the criteria. Some of them have 
are there for administrative placements. Oh, sure. Some of them there, you know, some of them right. will mm -hmm. be able to file for uh, medical exemptions, health exemptions, et cetera. And so that's why one of the uh, reports that we're going to bring back to the board is how many of the students that we currently have now would fall on the placement side versus how many of the students now would not qualify and would have to participate in the lottery. And if I might, uh, Chair Lichter, to your question in terms of is there a place in the middle, one of the things that we can do, and I know that uh, Dr. Elmendorf already started this work, was to look at e-learning. How do we leverage some e-learning seats to uh, open this up a little bit more for families? And so that is certainly work that we can take back for the team uh, because what I'm hearing is we certainly understand the fiscal implications, but we also want to be responsive to our families. So what's that number where we can meet six and a half million, leverage some other resources, and allow more students where this works for them? Um, to participate in the program. So should the motion be to postpone the decision until we get a revised proposal at the 228 meeting? You, there's, a, there's a motion pending. Uh, Chair a mo Lichter. Okay, right. Well, uh, can I take, can I delete my motion? If, if everybody and agrees. I'll, I would I'll withdraw my second. Okay, so we just. But it, your, you, your motion can be withdrawn with the consent of all the board members. Okay, so I'd like to withdraw my original motion. Um, my original motion. Do I have the consent of the board? Yes. Okay, what do we? What do you? Hearing say? no objection. Hearing no objection, we removed the. Yeah. We removed the motion. The new motion is we'd like to postpone a decision on the proposal for the VLP program for the upcoming school year until more information is provided at the February twenty eighth meeting. Second, Ms. Hen. Okay, any discussion? Okay, now we'll take a roll call vote on that second motion. Yes, I can put that in the chat. Um, motion to postpone a vote on the um, proposed revisions to the VLP program for the upcoming school year until more information, information is provided at the 228-23 BOE meeting. Whew. My grandmother was a court stenographer, so I got that fast typing. <laughs> okay, you got it? Okay, roll call vote, please. Ms. Jomanowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call Mr. Bersades. Nothing to report from oh. closed session, Ms. Lichter. Thank goodness. Okay, <laughs> next. We gained a couple minutes. The next item on the agenda is contract awards, and for that I call Ms. Joes, Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Uh, man Madam Chair, uh, I will be standing in as Vice Chair for Ms. Joes. Yes, okay, so, so I call on Ms. Harvey. Members of the board, the board's building and contracts committee met on Monday, February 13, 2023. Items M1 through M17 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Do I have a... Okay, no second is needed. Discussion, Ms. Pumphrey. Uh, can I just, I want to, I, I would like to move to pool item number two. To vote separately? Should I put that in the chat, the motion? Um, does she need to write that as a motion or we're just poll number two? It, it, it can just be voted on separately. Okay. Other discussion? So, so the motion would then be? Right. One, one and then, then three through? Three through 17. Right. Okay. So do I have a motion to approve items M1 and M3 through 17? So moved. I moved, Offerman. Okay, no second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Any discussion? Mr. Kuhn. 
Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Regarding contract NTA 512-23 Information Technology Research and Advisory Services, I just want some clarification. The contract spending authority is for $1 million. The term is five months, and it has two, it looks like two one-year extensions. And my, my only question is, <clears throat> does, is the $1 million being budgeted for the entire time, <laughs> or is it $1 million for five months? The uh, $1 million for the entire term. And that's just for Gartner uh, Consulting for, cool. how, is it by seat or is it for the entire organization? It is. Have access to. Yeah. So the, um, the services are for enterprise use. However, uh, there are five seats that we have that are within um, the division of IT. Um, but it does allow us to have consulting services um, or access to the authors of the research papers and, and analysis that Gartner provides and puts out. All right, thank you. Dr. Hager. Thank you. My question is for number six, the, um, the bus tracking application. Um, I just, when I first joined the board, we were having a lot of debates about a, a system that would have allowed for um, uh, cameras that would take pictures of, of folks who zoom past buses and they would be ticketed and that would then pay for cameras in buses and GPS systems and all these other things that uh, our school buses needed to be equipped for. And I thought we had had a discussion about revisiting a similar contract that would essentially pay for itself moving forward. And then this contract came forward with the GPS that's clearly needed. I guess I just wanted to know, um, is that something we're even pursuing anymore or have we just moved on to, to explore ways we pay for it ourselves? Um, and if so, would it investing this $2.5 million and then if in a few months we, we find a way that would have paid for it, is, is that the right move to go, I guess? Dr. Hager. Thank you for yes. your question. Um, you are correct. We have had conversations regarding other contracts. Um, but one of the charges that we received last year, very clear from our families as well as members of the board, was to improve our services and transportation and to improve our communication in terms of timeliness. And so one of the ways that we had to do that was to um, find a mobile and web-based uh, app bus tracking application. We started the pilot last spring and continued, expanded throughout the school year. Um, we are aware uh, of the company that remains available, but that uh, did not appear to be feasible uh, for Baltimore County Public Schools. And so as we continue to deliver on our promise to uh, deliver timely and efficient services to schools, uh, this trapping, tracking application allows us to move from pilot to all of the uh, students across the entire system. Um, whereas if we, we would have to go back to square one and delay the entire uh, rollout of the application tracking <coughs> system to all of our families if we wanted to uh, explore for an additional time the uh, company that you or the contract that you were referring to. That's fine. I, I was just curious if there was any movement in that direction. So thank you for your answer. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Mr. Kuhn, you also had a question about number six. I did. I, I had a quick follow-up, and I, I think it was answered, but I just want to clarify. This includes all buses and all contract buses that service Baltimore County. Is that correct? You are correct. All right. Thank you. Ms. Hen? Welcome. Thank you. I also had a follow-up question on six. Um, the board's objection to the contract we were discussing um, was not the service that was provided. In fact, our direction was to pursue other bit, um, potential bidders um, to provide that service. So I just wanted to make that clear. We've had um, numerous speakers um, present some false information to the public. So I wanted to, one comment on that effect, but also to ask whether or not 
the system has pursued um, other vendors to to provide that service before we we go this route. Uh, good evening, Ms. Hen. This is Dr. Grimm. Uh, at the present time, there are no other vendors that provide this type of comprehensive service that we were looking for previously. Okay. So at, at the time, I remember providing one that initially seemed to provide similar services um, and prov shared that information. So they were deemed not comparable, I take it? That is correct. There, there are no other vendors that provide the full-scale services that we're looking for as a system. Okay, thank you, Dr. Graham. Mr. Kuhn. Uh, thank you. Um, I do have a question about NTA 510-23, purchase of replacement and additional mo motor vehicles. This, this, this contract looks like it's for um, eight months and then two extension years, and it's for $14.5 million. Um, so, just looking at what was provided, it said the current fiscal year budget, it was $400,000. I guess I have a few questions. My first question is, are we just running out of budgeted dollars for this need since we only have $400,000, I guess, this fiscal year or left? And we need to add $14 million left? I'm just trying to get an understanding of how many vehicles we're looking at here because it's a significant dollar amount and, and I don't believe and perhaps you can I don't believe this covers any any bus any purchases of buses this is just passenger light and medium duty vehicles so Mr. Kuhn I'm, I'm going to answer the last part of your question first you're correct there are, this particular contract is not for any school buses you're absolutely correct it is for light and medium duty vehicles so it's for pickup trucks SUVs, vans, those those types of vehicles, not our large uh, dump trucks, for example, no school buses, uh, no reefer trucks, anything of that nature. Um, what this contract does is it actually reconceptualizes the way we have been purchasing vehicles in the past. Uh, due to the pandemic, um, we've had difficulty as, as everyone has in procuring vehicles and often with a lead time of 18 months or more, which makes it very difficult for, for us to replace vehicles. So for example, last year, the only vehicles that we could replace for this current year were our large 10 ton dump trucks. So we had difficulty procuring and replacing other vehicles that were on the replacement schedule. What this particular contract allows us to do, and, and similar to the question that you had for the IT contract, it provides us with the spend authority over a longer period of time to replace our vehicles piggybacking on a Baltimore County government contract so that as the need arrives, we can, we can purchase those, we can order those vehicles. What's happening is that the manufacturers are shifting their model for how governments can procure vehicles. And in fact, we had several vehicles that we were trying to purchase last year, which those were, those were, can, those were simply canceled. Those orders were canceled because the manufacturers weren't taking them. So it's a shift in model of how we're looking to procure vehicles moving forward in order to keep up with our replacement schedule and meet the needs of the system. Thank you for that answer. Just to follow on, I'm, I have a question about number nine, which I believe is related somehow, and that's what my question's about, the master lease financing. It talks about, it's a $62 million contract spending authority for five and a half years. And it looks as if we're going to attempt to use this financing vehicle to lease vehicles along with school buses, trucks, and other essential equipment. Is the money that we're talking about um, providing for this $14.5 million, is any of it going to be used in this master lease financing? And if not, can someone please just explain the master lease financing contract and why we would we are moving in that direction for vehicles? Um, the master lease, lease financing is just, uh, it's what it's been our practice, uh, our ongoing practices is that we, we lease vehicles and this is just an updated um, um, agreement. Is that, that's, 
I mean, that's that's we're not changing the way we pr our our business practice. It's it's been to lease vehicles, and this is just a uh, an updated lease con uh, contract. So the the fourteen and a half million dollar purchase of replacement additional motor motor vehicles. So we're buying some vehicles and we're leasing other vehicles is what I'm hearing. So it's actually the financing. It's the financing. It's the financing. It says lead, but it's actually the financing of it. We're not leasing vehicles. We're, we're, we're procuring vehicles. When I, what I meant was is this is the financing for vehicles. We've always financed vehicles. We've always, we've always, um, um, by financing makes sense. I understand yes. that, but when the word lease is in there, yes, yes, is that, is that a misnomer? What? I, I think it. I think it is. It is. It is. It's. Uh, it, it. It. It fooled me as well. It's. It's actually not. It's not leasing. It's. It's financing of the vehicles that we are buying. And, Mr. Kuhn, just to add some clarification in the in the school bus industry, it's common practice to call it a lease purchase because of the uh, limited lifespan of a school bus. And a unlike most conventional vehicle loans, a, a school bus loan is typically for six years and its life is for 12. So it's really called a lease purchase. And at the end of the 12 years, when we cycle those uh, school vehicles out, those school buses out, they go to they go to auction. So we own them outright at that time. But that, that's that's a term that's used quite a bit in the school bus industry as well. If that helps any provide any clarification. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Oh. I, I I think I got Ms. some explanation there. It, it is a bit confusing. And you're out of time, follow. Mr. Kuhn. But thank you for your questions. I'm sorry. Don't I have time for every? contract to speak I'm just want to clarify something because they're all different they're all different items that hasn't, that hasn't been the practice so we're voting on um, one and then three through 17 so you had your minutes for that so all right, thank you okay. so at this time Ms. Gober a roll call vote on one and three through 17 Ms. Dominowski Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Now, discussion on number two, contract two. Ms. Pumphrey, would you want to start? No, I just, no. I don't, oh, you just I want don't, it separated. I, need, I just needed to separate it. I don't need to discuss it. Okay, that. any discussion on number two? I have a, a question. This is Mr. Kuhn. Okay, go ahead. So I don't believe, and, and perhaps I've missed it in the past, um, but have contracts for hearing examiners always come to the board? I thought that a lot of that flowed through the law office and that we actually have our own hearing examiners. And so I'm just trying to understand um, what, and it's, this is only for an authority of $100,000 over three years. So we, I'm not quite sure how how it works. If someone, is it a per hour contract? We, we did discuss this at the, at, at the uh, meeting last night, and my understanding is we've been doing this all along. This is just additional um, um, hearing examiners, and they are on an as-needed basis. So my understanding would be that they would it would be an hourly um, um, contract. Mm -hmm. Good evening, uh, members of the board. This is Margaret Ann Howie. Mr. Kuhn, I'm able to answer or extend um, Mr. Hartlove's response if um, I'm permitted. That would be great. Yes, go ahead. Sure. So um, as indicated in the exhibit, uh, this is an extension that we already have contracts that have come before the board for your hearing examiners. This is simply for two additional examiners who are local. But yes, the board has voted previously on uh, hearing examiners on approving them for your panel. All right, thanks. 
Thank you. Um, roll call vote on number two. I, I, I oh. think we have a, a need to make a motion for number two first. Oh, do I have a motion to approve num item number t M2? Slumber to government. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation came from the committee. Any further discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Jominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Stain. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Next on the agenda is, wait a second, get into it. These contracts. Um, Next item on the agenda is the report on the Deer Park Middle Magnet School Capacity Relief Boundary Study. And for that, I call on Dr. Yarbrough, Mr. Dixit, Mr. Cropper, and Dr. Zarchin. Bless you. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, uh, Deputy Superintendent Dr. Yarbrough, and members of the board. We are here today to present the committee's recommendation for the Deer Park Middle Magnet School boundary chain. Joining me today are Dr. Zarkin, uh, Mr. Taylor of my team, Director of Strategic Planning, and our consultant, Mr. Matthew Cropper of Cropper GIS. And with this, I'll request Dr. Zarkin to make the presentation. All right, thank you. Good evening. The Deer Park Middle Magnet School Boundary Study process was conducted in the fall of 2022. The purpose of this boundary study was to provide capacity relief to Deer Park Magnet Middle School. As of September 30th, 2021, Deer Park Middle School was over capacity by 254 students, which is 120%, and is projected to continue to be over capacity in the future. The boundary study is consistent with the recommendation for capacity relief provided within the multi-year improvement plan for all schools. Next slide, please. The boundary process followed board policy and superintendent rule 1280. The process was facilitated by Mr. Matthew Cropper of Cropper GIS. Each school participating in the study established a committee which was comprised of the school's principal, two teachers, two community members, and Mr. Aaron Plymouth, who represented as the Northwest Educational Chair. Principals fully participated in the boundary study, however, they were not voting members on their committees. Only teachers, community members, and the chair of the Northwest area Education Advisory Council were voting members. BCPS staff from a wide range of divisions, departments, and offices supported the boundary study. At this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to Mr. Paul Taylor. Thank you. In order to provide capacity relief to Deer Park Middle Magnet School and make the best and most efficient use of available capacity in the region, Dr. Williams approved the initiation of a boundary change process, which contains four phases. The first phase began with planning from July through August 2022. The boundary study was then held from September through December 2022. The boundary study committee met four times during this period to formulate and review various boundary change options. The fifth scheduled meeting was not held because the committee felt prepared to vote and move forward a recommendation at their fourth meeting on November 30th, 2022. The next phase in the process continues this evening with committee's recommendation being presented to the board's initial review, further community input, and then a vote by the Board of Education on March 14th, 2023. Through the boundary study, BCBS supports a process that fully engages the community 
and shares information about the process and as it unfolds openly with all stakeholders. Next slide, please. Five Northwest Area Middle Schools participated in this boundary process. Uh, this slide outlines which schools participated. The boundary change will become effective fall of 2023. So following board approval, notification will be sent to all students attending the participating schools. Students will be notified of the boundary decisions and the next steps. BCBF staff will coordinate to ensure a smooth transition for all students. I would now like to introduce Matt Cropper of Cropper GIS to present the details and recommendation of the boundary study. Thank you. The boundary study objectives, um, the community-based comprehensive study is ta was tasked with meeting the following objectives. Uh, to reduce overcrowding at Deer Park Middle Magnet School, to create viable, successful boundaries that efficiently use capacity in all the participating schools, and to maintain or increase the student diversity among participating schools uh, in the region to reflect the diversity of the region and the school system. Next slide, please. As, as was mentioned, we always guided the committee to, to adhere to the Rule 1280 uh, as they considered boundary change, uh, changes for any particular area in the study area. Uh, these primary considerations were to make efficient use of capacity in affected schools and maintain or increase the diversity among schools uh, to reflect the diversity of the region and the school system. Next slide, please. Other considerations that we uh, guided the committee to look at and consider were to maintain the continuity of neighborhoods, to minimize to, uh, the impact, of, be mindful of the impact of transportation and pedestrian patterns on students, to minimize the number of times, times any individual students are reassigned, be mindful of long-term enrollment, capacity, and future capital plans, so not only look at students now, but look at be mindful of what's happening in the future. Location of feeder school boundaries and continuity of feeder patterns. Phasing in boundaries changes by grade level for high schools, which didn't apply since we were focused solely on middle school boundary changes in this effort. And other considerations that adhere to best practices in the industry are using geographic features such as railroads, creeks, and major highways when d designing uh, boundary changes or looking at uh, where to, to follow the, the lines. In addition to that, we were looking at support in the ESO ESOL strategic plan objective of returning students from the ESO ESOL centers to home schools. Next slide. The committee was represented uh, very well, broad-based, made up of people from all over the study area. There were 21 members, 16 of those were voting members. We had five principals on the committee and those were non-voting members, five teacher and staff representatives, 10 parents, which are two parents from each school, and then an area educational advisory council representative. We ask the committee to always, when they get around the table at these committee meetings, to focus on what's best for all children in the study area, uh, suspend their parochial interests and not focus on what's best for their child or their school or neighborhood, but what's best for all children in the study area as they work towards a recommendation. We ask the committee to participate in all, all meetings if possible, and that they are representatives of the com community, but along with that, that they provide input as it relates to what things are like in their community. Where is, how is traffic, uh, walkable areas, just things from the, on the local perspective that we may not know that they could pr participate and provide input on. Um, they held five committee meetings from September to November, and they collaborated exclusively with each, each other. The public was always offered the opportunity to come and observe meetings, um, but they are not able to participate in those committee meetings. And then finally, the committee was, is, uh, is tasked with presenting a recommendation to the Board of Education via the Chief of Schools. So in regarding public participation and input, letters were sent to all families in May 22 regarding the process, followed by additional outreach from schools uh, throughout the process. The focus is to try to make sure that everybody knows what's happening and that uh, the process is, is, is upcoming so that we can enable maximum participation. The public was invited to attend all meetings, like, like I mentioned, and they can observe in person. And all meetings were live streamed on the BCPS website. 
Uh, video recordings of those meetings were also saved and converted into YouTube clips. And so anybody can go back and look at prior meetings and things like that uh, to see what was discussed and what was uh, how the committee deliberated on various issues. And all information that's shared with the committee is always posted on the BCPS website and with the uh, effort of full transparency and making sure that any member of the public or anybody who is interested in the process can follow the process and, and refer to all the materials that the committee had at their, at their hands. Next slide, please. The public was invited to provide input through uh, multiple different uh, avenues. There was email address that they could, they could submit questions or comments to. There was an online comment form that, uh, where they could provide any kind of input at any particular time. And then there was also a survey that accompanied the public information session. We did have a public information session, which that session is designed for the public to, to, to give us input and talk with committee members around maps and, um, and listen to a presentation and really have uh, a gallery walk type of format where we can discuss the maps and discuss options with members of the public. Uh, the online survey were translated in multiple languages, and we had 121 total unique respondents participate in the online survey. Um, and as I said, it was provided in multiple different languages. Next slide, please. The committee considered six total options. They reviewed and discussed as a group all materials um, and reviewed all the information that, was, that had been collected and had been provided through the course of the study. Um, it was a really good committee. I'd say that this committee was very cohesive and they worked collaboratively. Um, they, they really worked good as a team and they were focused on making decisions for the, with the best for the, all students in this area. And, they, and I could tell that they were focused on that with an objective point of view. Um, they recognized that draft option D satisfied the most, the most boundary study considerations. Um, we had three options that were presented at the public information session, and then we had s surveyed the public uh, regarding three options. And, um, and then those options were then taken back to the committee and they continued to do their work in, in evaluating options, starting to get towards uh, a recommendation. Next slide, please. So this is just a, a go through the slides of some of the boundaries that um, and the options that were considered. And this is a large geographic area, so sometimes it's hard to see some of the details um, on a map. Um, but I will do my best to give you a little bit of insight on some of the areas. So these are the current middle school boundaries in the study area that we were working, working with on this study. If you go to the next slide. You can see this was draft option A, and there were adjustments that were, had been made um, through the course of this between Deer Park and Franklin. You could see up in the northern part of Deer Park, um, areas were sent to Franklin, and that's in a variety of options. There were some different configurations of that. And there was also looking at Deer Park sending to northwest and um, in, in the southeastern corner of Deer Park Middle School. This was really done, they're trying to make adjustments to move as few students as possible, but still accomplish our objectives. Um, this particular option did give relief to Deer Park, brought it to 99% 99 utilization, and it impacted the second lowest number of students of all the options. Um, as we said, we evaluated feeder patterns, and there was no impact to the feeders for middle and high school here. Um, and in all options, all students were able, were maintained in their walk zone. So any student that's in a walkable area was not put into a transportation situation other than be, they, they were all maintained within their walk zones in all scenarios, including this one. And then there were um, some adjustments from elementary to middle school, um, nine splits from elementary to middle compared to currently only five splits from elementary to middle school. So we look at, uh, at that and try to try to minimize the splits, but knowing that we're focused on middle school here um, There's only so many things we can do to try to manage the splits But we we're mindful of them and try to minimize the splits as we work through through the study uh, The next slide will show you option B and you could see just some some slight variations between Deer Park and Franklin Middle School up in the northern area and the same area was uh, was considered to go from Deer Park to Northwest. Um, again, 
other, other schools that are in the study area were not affected as part of this, this particular option with the, with the mind of trying to impact as few students as possible. This particular option brought uh, Deer Park down to 98%, uh, no impact to the middle and high school feeders. Again, walk zones were maintained. Um, and then we had the same number of splits from um, elementary to middle school as option A post. This did impact the second most students of any of the, of the options that were considered coming to the final ones that were under consideration. If you go to the next slide for option C, you can see, again, it's just another variation of Deer Park to, to Franklin. The committee was really focused uh, on this particular area because they could see some different alternatives that could be considered and they wanted to evaluate them and the data for them. This particular option brought Deer Park down to 97% and had all of the same benefits as the prior options with feeder patterns and walkability. Same limitations as the other options with uh, additional elementary and middle school splits, and, but this option did impact the most students of all the four options that they were, uh, that they were evaluating. And if you go to the last option, option D, this ended up being what was recommended by the committee. Um, this, this brought Deer Park down to, it was, uh, there was 109%, but if we, part of the process, this straddled a school year, so we, we introduced and brought some new inf enrollment information at a, a meeting, a later meeting in the process. And the reason, one of the main reasons for that is that Deer Park had um, a fluctuation in enrollment. Their enrollment was, they were at 120% when we were working through this originally. They had a drop in enrollment that brought them down to uh, a lower utilization. So we felt like it was important to share with the committee the um, current enrollment so that they could evaluate all of the options with the most recent enrollment. So when we were working with the 21 data, Deer Park was at 109%. But when we looked at, evaluated the new enrollment, it was down to 92% with this particular option. They still needed capacity relief, but they had fewer students than what they had in the prior year. So they'd made, so the, the thought was they may not need as much relief, but may not have to move as many students out of Deer Park because, um, because they had a drop in in their enrollment in that one particular in that this most recent year, so this recommendation does bring Deer Park to 92 percent, uh, brings them out down below 100. Um, it impacts the least number of students of all options. Uh, 240 students were impacted, which um, which is a, a, a good a good number uh, given that given that 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 the school needed relief. And so it was a good minimal number for students impacted. The feeder patterns and the walkability is same, same benefits as all the options. And then this has um, thir 13 splits from middle school to high school compared to 11 splits, although the splits are relatively balanced. So one of the things that we look at, if you do have to split a school, try not to make a very small percentage split. And if you have to have a split, make sure that the split has um, a good percentage uh, so that students, when they travel to the next level, they have familiar faces and people that they're familiar with and, and when they migrate to the next level. Uh, next slide, please. This is the voting outcome of, of the option of the, that led to option D. Um, voting members that were present um, all had the opportunity to vote. So and when you look at this, you could see that what, the way that we ran through the voting process with the committee was we asked to vote yes or no for each option to see what the committee members said. Um, when we asked if, if they would recommend option A, only one person said yes. When we asked them for B, no, nobody chose to recommend option B. When we asked option C, there was only one person that said yes and the, the rest said no. And then when we got to the option D, every single committee member voted yes for option D. So it was a unanimous vote and all committee members felt that option D was the best option for this, for this study area um, and the best one to bring forth to the board for, for recommendation. The next slide, please. And this is, again, just the, uh, a map, again, that shows you the final recommendation that the committee is bringing forth to the board. 
you could see this is, shows you some statistics and the data. This the first, as I was mentioning, the 2021 numbers shows you how the recommendation um, looks. And you could see with the, the yellow area with the, uh, the utilization numbers shows, demonstrates the imbalance and, and the need to provide relief to Deer Park. With this option, option looking at 2021 numbers, we brought everything in the balance, but Deer Park was a little high. If you go to the next slide, you could see how it looks in using the most current enrollment, and that's why we um, presented this in, 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 in showing that using the most current enrollment, it does provide a much better balance of relief and uh, relief to all schools and balancing utilization across the whole study area. Uh, next slide, please. Demographics were uh, studied in all options, comparing the current to the actual recommendation to, um, to evaluate the impact on demographics. And we didn't identify any particular, um, any, any particular negative impact uh, as it relates to demographic diversity uh, for this particular recommendation. Next slide, please. 240 students impacted, and uh, the, there are detailed tables that show how many students are moved from one school to the next, um, and those are shown in the in sort of the the pinkish color uh, rows or column, yeah, rows, and then the green reflects areas where students were not moved. So th that's the number of students that were not impacted as a result of this of the recommendation. Feeder patterns, like I said, we were constantly tracking feeder pattern splits and the, and the percentage of feeder splits and trying to, to, to make them improve the feeder patterns uh, in the area if at all possible. And uh, like I said, walk zones were not compromised. All students who were in a walk, walk zone are, were maintained in a walkable situation. With regard to next steps in the process, the board will hold a public hearing on the proposed boundary recommendation on March 1st, 2023 at Newtown High School to gather additional public comment. The Board of Education is then scheduled to vote on the boundary at its March 14th, 2023 meeting. We'd like to take this opportunity to recognize and thank all of our committee members, especially our principals who assisted in facilitating and leading their respective school boundary committees through this process. At this time, we are here to answer any questions. So thank you for that presentation um, I, in, in the work, and thank you to the committee. I've served on many boundary committees, and it is a um, tedious and very detailed process, so thank you. Um, any questions at this point from the board, Ms. Harvey? Just quickly, the... Uh, the boundary study recommended option impacts where you said it's in the pink. Can you explain what the what that's communicating? It says Deer Park, Franklin Middle School, 52. Just want to make sure I'm reading it right. Yes, ma'am. Um, that, that shows you where their current school is and where they would go in the recommendation and how many students it would, would, would move to that particular school. So if you look at that 52, for example, there are 52 students who are moving to Franklin Middle School from Deer Park. And then there were 100, 150 students from Deer Park to Northwest Academy. And that, that shows you how many students are moved from one building to another that make up the total 240 impacted. And then we're also moving students from Pikesville Middle School to Franklin and Northwest Academy. Yes, ma'am. That's correct. Any other questions? Dr. Savoy, do you have a question? When do you propose that all of the trailers will be gone? Mr. Taylor? Well, once we implement the boundary process, then we can consider relocating the relocatables to other schools. And we'll be implementing it and putting it in place in this upcoming school year. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you gentlemen for your presentation. You. And we'll look to the next steps. The next item on the agenda is, an in, is informational items, um, which includes the revised superintendent's rules 7330.
The next, okay, I'd like to make a motion to postpone agenda item P due to the lateness of the hour. Do I have a? So moved, Harvey. <laughs> Do I have a second? Second, Pumphrey. Um, roll call vote for those of us. Yes, discussion. Is P the agenda items again? Yes, but you may submit your agenda items. May we have your agenda item on our our leadership agenda for this coming week? If it's the same agenda item. It's the same agenda okay. item, but I'd like to share that. Go with ahead. The group. Okay. But if the group votes no, it's no. Okay. Well, maybe they won't vote no now that they heard your discussion. Okay. Miss. Um, Roll call vote. Ms. Jarmanowski? Voting. Voting to. Clear. Can you clarify, please? Yes. I was making the motion to skip agenda item P due to the lateness of the hour. Mr. McMillian does have something he'd like to say, so that's why I understand if everybody votes the other way. Maggie? Ms. Jarmanowski? No. Ms. Pumphrey? No. Mr. McMillian? I'm confused. Say no. Say you no. want to say no. No. Miss <laughs> <laughs> uh, Harvey? Yes. Miss Hassan? No. Mr. Offerman? Dr. Savoy? Uh oh. Propose. Do I <laughs> she said no. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lichter. No. Okay. Fails. So we'll go around. <laughs> Any comments, Ms. Demonowski? Um, Yes. I, just after follow-up, it goes well with what we have just represented with the boundary survey. I, I really think that we need to look at a process where we look long-term as opposed to overcrowding issues in our schools. I think we need a committee that works with, I don't know, um, our county council when there's communities being built, um, new neighborhoods, schools, uh, the school board needs to be involved in these conversations so that we're prepared and that these overcrowding issues and we're not moving kids and families to different schools when a lot of times they've moved to that community because of that school and they want to stay together. Thank you. Ms. Pumphrey? Nothing for me. Mr. McMillian? In regards to the VLE, I'm not a researcher and I don't pretend to be a researcher, but there's a, there's a, there's a PhD candidate project out there for somebody in the, in the audience, one of our teachers maybe, to track these kids. If we stop this program, we eventually want to stop it, but to track these kids and see what happens to them as they progress through our system. On the agenda item piece, we, were, we voted against this last time. I went out into the parking lot and I, vote, and I text Dr. Williams and, and Ms. Lichter about having a presentation on athletic trainers on our session. So I did make it on last one. Ms. Lichter and I talked. Uh, you know, hopefully we'll make it to the next one. You know, we need to look at athletic trainers in our high schools. We've got 24 high schools. We currently, we were not filling 10 positions in high schools. And these athletic trainers, it's a critical, critical it's a life and death situation. So we really need to look at that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Harvey? I have no items for discussion. Ms. Hassan? I have no items. Happy Valentine's Day. Okay. Um, may we all get into good trouble. Uh, Dr. Savoy? I'd like to thank Dr. Williams for his exemplary service to the Baltimore County Public Schools, and I wish you well in your next endeavor. Secondly, I would like to propose that all funding be disseminated equitably. And thank you for this wonderful meeting. Happy Valentine's Day to everyone. Thank you. I think that is Everyone, correct? Did I miss anybody? Okay, I don't have anything. <laughs> I'm done. All right. Wait, <laughs> there's certain words I need to say. <laughs> what? Uh, the last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, February 28th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. The board will hold a public hearing on the Deer Park Middle Magnet School Capacity Relief Boundary Study on Wednesday, March 1st, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. at Newtown High School in the auditorium. Sign up for speakers will begin at 5.30. Thank you for joining us tonight. Sorry about the lateness of the hour. The meeting is now adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>